Good morning and welcome to our meeting today on understanding bias and fairness in AI-enabled healthcare software. This is a public convening by the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy supported by the Pew Charitable Trust. And on behalf of the Duke Margolis Center, um, I'm um, Mark McClellan, I'm the director here. I'm also an independent director on the boards of Johnson & Johnson and Cigna. And I'm really pleased that you're with us today. Today's meeting is a timely one. Artificial intelligence has been shown to be a powerful computational tool that can help improve decision-making. Building on the proven effectiveness and the impact of AI-enabled software and other domains, AI has been introduced in many areas of medicine. Its applications in healthcare range from AI analysis of sensor collected data from wearables to appointment scheduling software to clinical decision support software for diagnosis and treatment recommendations, and even AI aided research and development tools for medical product development. As a resource, AI enabled healthcare software has the potential to significantly improve decisions, efficiency, and outcomes in healthcare. However, there's also evidence that AI might contribute to incorrect decisions and can worsen health disparities if careful attention isn't directed to potential biases and if the underlying data used in the software are not well understood or if the software is applied in diverse contexts. Ensuring that AI-enabled software delivers on its intended benefits and does not perpetuate or introduce biases and conversely potentially could even help in addressing implicit biases it's a critical challenge for assuring that AI in healthcare really improves health for all. Given the importance and the potential benefits that AI presents, but also these risks, how to regulate the software has also been a pressing issue. We'll have the opportunity at the end of the meeting today to hear from government agencies themselves on their perspectives and initiatives to address this topic. Throughout the meeting, our multidisciplinary expert panelists and diverse perspectives will continue this conversation and advance it on ways to monitor, inform, and improve AI in healthcare to create a healthier population and a more equitable healthcare system. The goal of the meeting is to discuss how biases arise in healthcare artificial intelligence, the tools and strategies that can help mitigate these biases, and whether AI itself can be implemented in a way that reduces human biases and improves health outcomes and equity as a result. Throughout the discussions, we'll be looking for potential policy recommendations to help ensure that health AI products are effective, unbiased, and fair. Now, before we get started, I wanna review a few fu fundamentals uh, for the meeting today. Uh, so on the uh, next slide, I think, uh, see our statement of independence at Duke Margolis. This is uh, standard for our meeting, standard for Duke. Um, and our academic statement means that neither Duke nor the Margolis Center or its members take partisan positions. Of course, all of us and everyone here is free to speak their minds and express their opinions regarding important issues. On the next slide uh, uh, shows uh, what we're expecting to uh, accomplish today. Uh, on our meeting agenda. Um, in a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Christina Silcox, the Digital Health Policy Fellow at Duke Margolis, who will provide a brief overview of the role and potential impact of artificial intelligence in healthcare. She'll provide some context, some key definitions and themes that will serve as the foundation for today's discussion. Then in session one, we're going to hear presentations on how bias can be introduced into healthcare software through the software development process. Session two will then build on that to highlight potential solutions and approaches to identifying bias in algorithms uh, and in how the data are used to support uh, in conjunction with those algorithms. In session three, panelists will discuss how AI can be used as a tool to address human biases in healthcare as a way to rectify health inequities. Then in the final session, we'll, there will be a federal agency roundtable, as I mentioned before, to talk about past and present government initiatives and policies on this important and evolving topic. And just a few reminders on the next slide before we get started. We're hoping for an engaging discussion throughout the meeting. There are going to be opportunities for all of you who are joining us today to submit questions via the Zoom Q&A. That's the Q&A box, typically at the bottom of your Zoom screen during the discussion part 
of each of today's sessions. Feel free to submit questions or comments at any time, though, using the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible, either in dialogue or, or through written responses. We're going to begin each of these sessions with some prepared remarks and then get to that open discussion. For all of our presenters today, Brian Cantor will be advancing your slides, so just give him a verbal cue when you're ready to move to the next slide. And for everyone, we are also on Twitter. We encourage you to tag us in your tweets about this meeting under the handle at Duke Margolis, at Duke Margolis. As a reminder, you can view the meeting materials on our website. That includes the speaker bios, includes a background document with links to suggested uh, resources for expanding on the topics that we're discussing today. And with that, I'm very pleased to turn the meeting over to Christina Silcox, our Digital Health Policy Fellow for the opening presentation. Christina. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and I also want to say welcome to all of our participants in this meeting today and a big thank you to our panelists who are coming up. Um, what I want to do for the next 10 minutes or so is just set the stage, um, give some definitions, give some ideas of what we, what we uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about um, for, for the rest of the day. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so first I want to talk about use cases of AI and health. When we say AI and health, that's actually an enormous topic. Um, and USAID actually wrote a paper a couple of years ago, kind of artificial intelligence and global health. Um, and they had a beautiful figure that I use all the time that went through some of these use cases. And as you can see, there's a bunch um, that goes in population, starts in population health for surveillance and prediction, um, population risk management, um, and then individual health where you have care routing such as uh, triage and referrals and outreach as well as care services, so diagnostic support, clinical decision support, remote monitoring. Um, on the health system side, uh, they can use AI for medical records, um, for fraud prevention, for supply chain management, for all kinds of administrative type things. Um, and then in the medical product development space, pharma and med tech are using AI every day to help support their development activities, their clinical trials, their, 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 their safety surveillance, um, and also real world evidence um, uh, production. So when we say AI, AI and health, this actually is an enormous topic. Today, we, we're happy to talk about any of those topics, um, but the majority of the time, we're gonna be talking mostly about medical products. And by that, I, uh, I mean um, products that are used for individual health. Um, and then also, and, and would often be, although not always under FDA's authority, um, as well as some of those Kind of adjacent products around population, um, population health and wellness pro uh, products that may not be under FDA uh, authority, but um, still still have effects on, on sort of individual people as a, as a medical product, as opposed to some of these development or administrative spaces. Um, so next slide. So when we talk about AI itself, that is also a hugely broad term. Um, so, so when we use AI at Duke Margolis, we mean a general term addressing machine behavior and function that exhibits the intelligence and behavior of humans, very broad. Um, and so that actually can be divided up into rules-based AI, um, which are algorithms programmed to use rules to guide decision-making. These are generally rules that, were made, that, that are made from clinical guidelines or other um, accepted literature and, and, and consensus. Um, there's also machine learning, and machine learning is more of a data-based AI, which is algorithms that use data to create relationships without being explicitly programmed. And those relationships may be explainable um, or, or may not, depending on how the machine learning is done. Next slide. When we talk about bias, you can have bias in both types of AI. And so I'm showing you two identical head, or essentially identical headlines. And one is talking about a machine learning algorithm, and one is talking about a rules-based algorithm. And so so we know that bias exists in both places. Next slide. And now when we talk about bias, what do we mean? Um, so for the purposes of this meeting, a biased algorithm is an algorithm that demonstrates significantly different performance in a subgroup of, a, of the population of interest. And so that, those subgroups might be multiple things. So it might be demographic subgroups, so racial, ethnic, age, um, et cetera. It might be a socioeconomic subgroup um, with differences in income, insurance status, et cetera. Uh, there might be geographic differences. Do algorithms work better in urban centers versus rural centers, settings? Um, and, and, and kind of along with that in different health systems? Um, or does it work, uh, does it not work as well with 
subgroups of different comorbidities. Um, so all of these things are really important. Um, and when we think about a biased algorithm, we might be thinking about one of those dimensions, or we might be thinking about a combination of dimensions. And that's where it really gets tricky, because at some point you, you pull together so many combinations of dimensions, um, an algorithm almost certainly won't work quite as well for one person as it does for the next. There's just going to be natural variation. And so where is the acceptable limit for that? Where is it not? And how can we deal with algorithms that work quite as well? Next slide. Excuse me. Uh, so now we're talking about equity, uh, equality versus equity. And so when we talk about equality, we talk about everyone using the same resources, giving everyone the same resources and opportunities. Um, equality, however, does not ensure that everyone reaches the same outcomes. And that's what we're mostly interested in, in, in health justice. Equity addresses some of these imbalanced social systems themselves, recognizing that individuals have different circumstances and need different resources and opportunities to reach the equal outcomes. Disparity refers, refers to that difference in equality. So when you have an in, uh, inequitable system, disparity uh, measures that difference. Next slide. So here we have a little cartoon that, that helps try, uh, try and explain those differences in a visual way. So you can see here that um, in the first panel, you have inequality, where one person gets an apple and another person doesn't. And it, it happens somewhat by chance. Um, although it depends, it's based on where those, those two people are standing. Um, you could try and fix this in an equal way by giving both people step ladders, um, and then one person is able to reach the apples. Um, and even though you, but even though you gave an equal size ladder to the other person, they aren't able to reach, uh, reach an apple. And you saw that with uh, equity. So equity, um, it's, where we, it's where we add a support that is appropriate to the situation. Um, and so that both people can, can reach those apples. And then finally, we have justice. Um, and in justice here, we've seen that we've added supports to the system itself, to an unjust system itself, to make the system more just so that you can then give equal resources to everyone and they still, you still end up with an equitable outcome. So when we talk about health justice, what it, uh, the AAMC Center for Health Justice defines that as giving every community an equitable chance at being healthy by addressing persistent political, economic, and social inequities and injustices that affect all sectors that serve our communities and have a disparate impact on the health of marginalized communities. So next slide. Uh, there have been an enormous number of federal efforts to help address bias and fairness in AI, um, and, and, and AI more broadly, and also AI in health. Here is a list of, 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 of just some of the re most recent efforts, not in any way exhaustive. Um, and in fact, NIST just uh, put out a, uh, just this week published a concept paper to help guide development of their AI risk management uh, framework that they put out earlier this year. Um, and we're gonna be talking, uh, the federal, uh, the participants in the federal uh, agency roundtable will be talking about some of these initiatives. Next. So now I just wanna step back and just give a couple more definitions and then I promise we get on, get on to the panelists. So when we talk about how machine learning uh, algorithms are made, I just want to talk about a couple of different terms that are sometimes used. Um, and so this, when I'm talking about these, I'm talking about supervised machine learning. Um, and, and here I'm giving an example of machine learning, a supervised machine learning algorithm that was made through data collected from patient populations in a health system. Um, and so when you're training your data, what you would do is you would uh, collect from different health systems, um, or one or more health systems, and you collect patient populations into a training, data from a patient population into a data training data set. Um, part of that training data set would be then taken out and, and reserved as a test data set. That's really good machine learning practices, but not the scope today. But the training data set would then be used to input into the learning algorithm to create, an algor to, to create the resulting AI algorithm that would then be um, used in the medical product. Next slide. So I just talked about what training data is. A testing data, like I said, is a subset of, uh, of the training data that's used to test algorithmic performance after system is trained. That, that's, that's data that's from the, uh, from the original training set, a subset of that, but not, not used for training. Operational data, on the other hand, is the data used to make a prediction once the algorithm is in use. And so you have data about a patient, you have an algorithm, you'll put that data in, out will come a prediction that will be used in clinical practice. Um, clinical study or performance data are the results of evaluations of this algorithm. So when we talk about data, it's really important to talk about what data we're talking about, otherwise it can get confused. 
So next slide. So finally, this is my last slide. I just wanted to talk a little bit about how AI becomes biased or unfair. And as we've done our informational interviews around this topic and done our research around this topic, we've really gathered this into a couple of buckets um, that overlap a little bit um, that, that follow the product life, uh, the product development cycle. I'm not gonna get too deeply into this because this is really gonna be for session one to talk about, but I did wanna give people the, 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 the overall summary. So when we think about how does AI become biased or unfair or equitable, you might start out by asking the wrong question. Are you asking a question that's, that, that's when it gets answered is going to lead to, to, to health disparities? Um, you might have unrepresented training data. So you, you don't include enough data from, from, from different groups. And so that out, resulting algorithm might not work as well on, on those groups. You might have bias within the training data. And this is a topic that, that for the session one presenter, we're gonna talk a lot about, so I'm not gonna um, spend, spend any time on that. Um, but you also may make choices during the curation and during your uh, algorithmic uh, training process that also can cause differential performance among subgroups. And that's really important to keep in mind. And then finally, um, once the algorithm is produced and put out into the world, people might take actions based on the predictions um, that end up causing a disparate impact. And so there's a lot of different ways that bias can enter the algorithms. And we're really excited to have our panelists today talk about the different ways that can happen, what the impact is of that, and then where there are solutions and tests and mitigation techniques to prevent that from happening. So with that, I am pleased to turn this over to my colleague, Jillian uh, saunders Midler, who will be moderating our first session. Jillian is the deputy director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy and a professor of population health sciences and medicine at Duke University. Jillian? Thank you, Christina. Um, so we're gonna now begin, as Christina mentioned, our, our first session, and we're gonna be hearing from three presenters on how bias can be introduced into AI in healthcare, and then following it by re reactant remarks. So afterwards, we're then gonna have an open panel discussion. Um, so we're going to first hear presentations from Chris Hemphill, who's VP of Applied AI at Actium Health, and then next from Kasia Chemelinski, who's the co-founder of the Data Nutrition Project and affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. Um, and then finally from Benjamin Goldstein, who's an associate professor of biostatistics and bioinformatics here at Duke. We'll then hear from two reactants uh, with some remarks from Pilar Osario, who's a professor of law and bioethics at University of Wisconsin in Madison, and then uh, Shaman Parvane, who's a senior manager of data science and AI at Edwards Life Sciences. So I'm now gonna turn it over first to Chris Hemphill for our first presentation, um, and Chris. One second, I'm just testing my, uh, okay, perfect. Excellent, thank you. All right, well, uh, first of all, Christina, I just wanted to give a big thank you for uh, such an excellent frame up of the conversation and, and what we'll be digging into. It's so making my job easier, I don't have to go and explain uh, AI, but uh, there was there's one part that really struck out uh, stuck out to me was when you were talking about the difference between training data and test data and all the different things that we're focusing on to, uh, make, this, uh, to, to make AI a reality. Uh, a big question one might have is why would we go through this process? Why uh, take, take on uh, looking at like dividing data in all these ways? Well, uh, it's to get to a nuanced perspective of what people's care needs are. So for all these, uh, the, all these AI use cases, we're looking to enable decisions at scale uh, based on nuance that like if you hand me a spreadsheet that has more than three rows and, and 50 columns, I start getting confused. So it needs to be nuanced and uh, analyzed in a way that uh, we're incapable of uh, just, just looking at all these millions of rows and thousands of patient characteristics. So starting from that why, I just wanted, to, wanted everybody to hang out onto that concept of nuance, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. Quick introduction on me, uh, uh, VP of Applied AI at Actium Health which is a uh, healthcare uh, CRM intelligence company out of uh, Palo Alto. I'm in Atlanta, it's out of Palo Alto. And we're focused on identifying next best actions, care pathways for patients based on uh, their clinical scenarios. Uh, so that really aligns with this mission that I have, which is helping people to make healthy decisions based on evidence and science. 
but there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot that there, there's a lot to uh, look at in terms of why I'm excited and enthusiastic about this, this uh, data ethics and health AI concept. Because when we're talking about helping people to make uh, healthy decisions, we have to understand which, uh, which people, how populations are addressed. When we talk about the difference between equality, equity, and justice, we're talking about things like if we're, if we're using data to address these issues, the data that, uh, that, that we're using, the data that comes in, from uh, people who have episodes of care or events that then are tracked in electronic medical records and other systems, those data points are reflective in aggregate. They're reflective of the lack of justice and the lack of equity that uh, we, we see in broad society, econ uh, like in, in our overall economic uh, society and in the business processes, policies within healthcare systems and all the way down to uh, the individuals that are making choices on how they listen to people, how they uh, determine who needs what type of care. All of that gets reflected. Uh, and then it, like all, all of that bias comes from these different areas of society and healthcare systems, policies, and business. And then it kind of falls on this data science perspective. The, the reason that this conference is exciting is because we're looking at ways of uh, acknowledging that the data that we're, that we're receiving are, are extremely challenged. So how do we uh, address that? So I'm going to zoom in on uh, the healthcare use case, uh, the, the health system use case, but hopefully we'll get some examples and ideas that extrapolate and generalize to the rest of the conversation. So quick frame up the high trust, uh, the, 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 the high tech act, sorry, not high trust, high tech act uh, of 2009 enabled uh, what was called meaningful use and resulted in a tidal wave, a deluge of data for uh, US healthcare systems to deal with. So a lot of the studies that uh, Christina was addressing a little bit earlier probably wouldn't have been possible if that data enablement wasn't there. So yes, while it was a, a giant wave of data, it did enable uh, all kinds of different use cases, all kinds of different ways to getting to nuance uh, for, for health systems. It's a challenge initially to, uh, to, to launch, but what's, what we've been happening, there are things to celebrate such as uh, advancements, uh, uh, AI advancements in disease detection. An example, uh, plenty of examples, but I, I, I'm honing in on uh, a uh, breast cancer model, a deep learning model that was released uh, early last year that uh, could detect breast cancer from images uh, at a very high, a AUC means area under the curve, uh, is a measure of accuracy, so at a very high accuracy. Other use cases cover population health, such as the potential for improvement in uh, overall quality measures uh, in, in, in population health initiatives and quality uh, management initiatives. And even in outreach, where we're concerned with how we're engaging patients, what kinds of channels they're, uh, they're reaching out to, that can result in all kinds of growth as well. But when we focus on these metrics, when we're celebrating overall metrics like, like these, there's one thing that they all have in common, and that's that these are aggregated metrics. I'm gonna kind of make a villain of aggregation uh, and, and you'll see why in a second, but the, the, like for folks who, who might not know what I'm really talking about when I say aggregated, what I mean is aggregated, uh, we're, we're, we're looking 50,000 uh, 50, feet, we're, we're able to see top down, uh, like they're, they're, we're able to see really high, uh, really good uh, metrics that, that we're celebrating. But just like, we're, uh, I'm putting in the context of a car, like we, we get a nice car, a nice used car off the lot, everything looks like it's performing well, but there's problems with the engine. There's problems when we start looking a little bit deeper. So AI, the whole purpose, is like, like being able to look at these thousands of patient characteristics and things like that is all about getting to that nuanced perspective, all about uh, we're, we're moving away from this, this reliance on overall means and medians and averages, and we're really trying to get individualized on, on how we address issues. So we should be looking at that from a strategic perspective as well, because sometimes the holes, those things that we celebrate, hide devils in the details. Some examples, that 11% growth in volume might uh, not reflect uh, uh, equitable access to people who might not be able to afford care or certain racial groups or uh, by uh, gender or sex. Uh, that extremely well-performing model that has a, a, like, like an overall extremely high accuracy outperforming physicians, they're putting out the papers and bragging about that. But what if that model, what if that performance for certain populations and subpopulations doesn't perform well for those uh, subgroups? What are we hiding? What are we missing if we're only focusing on the aggregate? That 87% improvement in quality measures might uh, be based on algorithms that, that have uh, reflected bias, kind of like uh, uh, one of the algorithms that uh, Christina had referenced earlier. So why are we ignoring this uh, important nuance that, that's occurring? Well, 
I want to just take a step back and talk, talk about the types of error that can occur in uh, AI algorithms. Uh, the, the, the biggest focus that you see, you probably heard about this in your stat class or whatever, are type one and type two error. Type one error real quick, uh, it's a false positive. Uh, the doctor said that you're pregnant, but you're not pregnant. Or uh, a false negative, you're not, uh, you are pregnant, but the doctor misses that. So type one, type two error, extremely easy to test for there, uh, uh, within a data set. There's all kinds of statistical, yeah, statistical tests, confusion matrices that tell us what that is. Uh, but type three error is that we're asking the wrong questions. The theme of this conversation, we are asking the wrong questions. Uh, so typically, so how, how do we reframe that thinking to where we're focused on the right things? Well, your typical, your, your, your best practice for, for, your, for AI is to start with the strategic objective of the health system. So in this example, the strategic objective is to uh, increase utilization of service lines. Then we go back into what kind of predictions we need to make to help increase that uh, utilization. Well, we need to know the risk that people have and how uh, they would like their communications to, uh, to flow. And to do that, we need data. Great, that's great for like a strategic business case for AI, but there's a major thing missing here. And that is uh, in that strategic objectives uh, section. So the concept here is that your strategic objectives, what you're aiming for, what you're optimizing for should reflect, I said health equity, but I, I think I need to change this slide to health justice. I, I really like that term and that framing, but the strategic in initiatives should reflect that, uh, that, that justice concept. So some examples of what that might look like, aggregated, that, uh, that, that aggregated view, like where we celebrate growth and service line volume, maybe the strategy should be around expanding access to care to all our communities. When we think about, high, like on my side, on the data science side, high, accurate, high test accuracy for AI models, maybe we should be focused on how these models perform for all populations, and rather than just an overall generalized metric. Improving quality, uh, quality measure attainment, what about equitable experiences, uh, the things that, that build up quality, the, the types of experiences and the listening uh, that, the, that this in the patient clinician relationship, how about we make sure that that's reflected for, for all interactions? This slide got a little messed up, but I just wanted to provide a case study uh, for an organization, Virtua Health, that is focusing on these, uh, that, that has this uh, diversity initiatives at a strategic level. And um, just real quick, they're at, uh, like they had an algorithm that had a, a certain level of outreach, but it was significantly underperforming for uh, Black and Asian patients. Uh, but by taking that, uh, taking that into account, uh, and and uh, having that communication and, and using artificial intelligence to then make adjustments to, uh, to that outreach pattern. We can get deeper into that in the questions, but they were able to improve, increase uh, their outreach to underserved groups by 23%. So long story short, when we start with strategy, then like things that, uh, like this that come to that data science pipeline that we're addressing, the, the, the things that we're building, Everything should reflect, everything should, should, should come down from that strategy. So when we get to that data science pipeline, Christina showed a version of it, I'm showing a version of it, but at that strategy level first and at the policy level first that a lot of uh, people here are focused on how we best address the path to influence that, if our strategies align with health equity, then the modeling approaches and efforts should follow. Wonderful, thanks, Chris. Um, next, we're gonna turn to Kasha. Hey there, can you see and hear me okay? We can see and hear you, great. Fantastic. Um, great, so thanks so much for having me. A um, uh, big thank you to the Margolis Center and also the framing by Christina. I thought that was fantastic. It means uh, similar to Chris, I, I won't have to cover many things, which I'm appreciative of. Um, we can just jump straight in. So if you go to the next slide. So uh, like I said, my name's Kasha. I'm actually a technologist. I spent most of my career uh, building software systems and AI systems among many and across many domains. Uh, more recently, I've turned my attention to data set standards and, and quality uh, as an affiliate at Harvard and also as the co-founder of an organization called the Data Nutrition Project, which I will talk a little bit about. Um, but before I do that, I think it's important to, uh, as, as my peers have done previously here, to talk a bit about the problems. If you go to the next slide. Um, these are just some, some quick uh, excerpts from the media that I pulled and threw on the slide here, um, all showing kind of the end state uh, when we have issues with regards to AI either in algorithms uh, or in uh, devices. And really the thing that I wanna call out here is that AI systems that are built 
on incomplete or biased data are going to exhibit the same problematic outcome. So you are what you eat, essentially. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, Chris talks a little bit about this as well, but there's a, a pipeline that should actually begin here with the business question. Uh, it's kind of inferred here, but definitely should not be, where you say, I, I, I think I want to solve this question or, or so solve this uh, problem or answer this question, and therefore I'm going to go gather this data, which I'm going to pre-process, I'm going to clean it, there might be missing values, I'm going to do something with that, I'm going to then develop my model on that, and then I'm going to deploy that model. So all the examples in the previous slide are examples of, of issues that we see at the deployment stage, right? So something's already been deployed. It's been developed. It's been launched. And if you're catching issues in the deployment stage, um, this is a problem because uh, you you have to do something about that, obviously, especially if you if there's a media story written about you. Uh, and often what I've seen in, in industry is that you try to change the model. So you tweak the model to address the issues. But if the underlying issues came from the data, which it so often does, um, that's incredibly expensive. It may take a long time to go all the way back to the beginning. So um, the big push that I've kind of been focusing on, I'll focus on for the rest of this, this talk, is how do you identify issues in the data before you get all the way down the pipeline to the deployment? We go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is an example from, from healthcare. I'm not a doctor, but I've had the great fortune of working with some. Um, I will kind of mention that there are some images of skin in the next two slides. So if you are at all squeamish, uh, you can close your eyes. I will try to walk through this with words as well. Next slide, please. So there's a very strong case for using melan uh, for using AI from, to detect melanoma. Mel mel melanoma is a skin cancer. Um, it can be very, uh, it can be deadly, but in almost 100% of the case, it is curable if it's found early. Uh, so there's a lot of focus on, hey, can we use AI to look at a, a picture of skin and then determine whether or not this is cancerous? Um, that would also address some of the major barriers to getting access uh, because there aren't enough dermatologists, especially in some areas areas of the country and the world. Uh, and so we've worked with Dr. Rodenberg at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. Um, and the work that she's doing here, I should mention, is ongoing. It's not yet published, but she's doing some fascinating work around image uh, data sets for skin. And you can see on the right here, there's two images, one that is um, a picture that, that is cancerous and the, the next of a skin lesion that is not, it is benign. And you can see that the dermatologists and the AI are, are in kind of a dead heat here, right? So the AI actually kind of trumps the dermatologists in both cases where um, the sensitivity of identifying whether or not that's melanoma or benign is actually over the sensitivity of the dermatologists, which is fantastic. But this is this is kind of what Chris was saying about aggregated versus nuanced, because when you look under the hood, to use that car analogy, um, there are many ways in which the AI is not working so well. So if you go to the next slide, and I'll talk quickly about this because I don't have too much time, but the specificity essentially drops in the gaps where there wasn't training data. So like I said before, you are what you eat, right? If you, if you are training an AI system on, on data and then you give it some information later that it's never seen before, it's not gonna be able to understand what that is because it's never seen it. Um, so these are some of the kinds of issues that you might face. And again, this is Dr. Rodenberg's work. And so this is coming directly from, from what she's doing, which is fascinating. She's basically taking existing AI algorithms and she's kind of um, testing them to see their bias by giving them images they've never seen before. Uh, and what she shows is that on the left, for example, these are both benign um, the images of, of benign skin lesions, uh, but one contains a crust and one does not. So this is an image feature, right, that wasn't in the training data. And you can see the specificity drops from about 80 to about 40 percent, which is significant. Even more significant, though, is in the middle, um, where you've got an image from clinic A versus clinic B. And there's been something uh, that's been in, in the clinic B situation where maybe it's a different camera, maybe they processed it or pre-processed it differently, uh, maybe it's the angle, it might be the light, um, but that drops from 90% to 1.5% of the time specificity. And then on the right-hand side is the worst of all, which is just, you know, representation gap. So underrepresented populations, unusual anatomic sites, since we're talking about skin here. Um, and so in this case, you have darker skin, skin tone where the AI just doesn't even know what to do. So this is really pointing to what can happen with the top AI algorithms out there that have been built and deployed and maybe used um, when the training data was not representative. Now, how's that going to do when you when you start talking about that nuanced case um, and not the aggregated? Go to the next, please. 
So what I what I love about Dr. Rodenberg, Rodenberg's work is that she goes a step further and she says, well, you know, she's got her data set and her images and she's testing all these AI algorithms. What about all the other stuff out there, right? This is a hot area. There's a lot of studies. There's a lot of um, AI that's being built. And so they did a survey and showed that um, the problem is even one level deeper. So you have bad data and or problematic data. There's really no such thing as an unbiased data set. But there's, you know, things that you need to know about that data set. And then there's all these studies in AI that's built on the data set. And in many cases, these studies in AI are not even talking about the data that's underlying, right? So if you want to do the right thing and say, how should I or should I not use this AI? You can't even tell because often you don't know how it was trained. And that's kind of what, what this study is showing is that a, a vast minority of studies even talk about the data that they used when they did the study. Next, please. So, so we've talked a bit about the problem with data, various problems that can happen. Um, and I think that there's an additional problem there, which is around transparency. And how do you start to actually talk about those issues? Well, you need to have a shared language and a shared framework. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is just to say, um, I don't do this alone. There are a lot of people who are involved in this. This is the, um, the DNP team. Next slide, please. So our focus is really on bringing transparency because like I said, there, there, you know, th there's a data set. There are always going to be issues with that data set. There are certain ways we need to start to talk about the issues and frame those issues so that we can translate that and communicate that to people who are going to use the data set. Um, and the analogy we use is kind of like uh, the box of cookies that's me in cartoon form. Should I eat that cookie? Well, I need to know what's inside before I can decide whether to eat it. Same with the data set. Next, please. So the kinds of things we're looking for specifically when it comes to bad data, and th this is a vocabulary that's not just ours, or, you know, hopefully it's a shared vocabulary. So feature selection. What are the uh, definitions of the data? Are there data elements that are proxies for other things, such as zip code in the US is often a proxy for race? Um, representation, we saw that in the skin images. How did you curate and collect this data? What was the race of the survey taker um, versus the race of the person who was taking the survey? Um, sorry, the, the survey giver versus the taker. Um, how did you sample that training data? What happened to that data once you had it in its first form? Did you process that? How did you clean it? How did you decide how to impute data? Um, is there anything missing, which is related to the known errors as well, right? Are there domain specific errors? I'm not a doctor. I don't know what could be wrong, especially with regards to the domain. Uh, and then privacy, you know, is there, was there consent given? Are there any restrictions on that data in terms of its usage? And then one step further than that too, which I think hopefully is a theme that you're hearing here is it's not just about the data itself. It's about the context in which it is used and understood and communicated. Um, you need to know how that data should or should not be used. Now, if I collected my data all in the United States and then I'm building systems that will only be deployed in the United States, maybe that is less of an issue, um, maybe. But if I have data that is collected in the US and then I'm trying to build things that are gonna be deployed outside the US, that might be something I need to flag. So it really has to also be mapped to how the data is intended to be used, how it should or should not be used. Next, please. This is just an image of what this all looks like once you put it together. Um, don't need to go into this. Next slide, please. And then these are, this is the way that those, uh, those images are, sorry, those issues are flagged when it comes to the, the label. Next, please. So this is just to say that for those who are thinking through how to approach data, how to talk about data, um, how to build data sets and use data sets, that this kind of framing of we know all data is biased, there are categories of issues we should look for, there are ways that we should be transparent about that and communicate that out, right? Because this is a chain of people and um, processes that goes from data to AI so that we have that transparency and communication for the people who are going to pick up that data set, who are going to Google the data set, who are going to buy the data set, and um, you know, then are going to use it for something else. Uh, next, please. Finally, um, you know, why do this at all? Well, it starts with the data, but it ends with the AI, right? And so improving data quality means that obviously the data analysis will be better, but that will in turn improve the overall quality of the models. And that will kind of be this virtuous cycle where people who start to use models are looking for better data and that will enable the creation and publishing of better data. And uh, I believe my time is up, so that's it. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to the Q&A. Wonderful, thank you, Kasha. Um, and next, our final speaker is Ben. Great. Um, again, I just want to thank Christina um, for setting this up and also my co-panelists for setting up this um, 
the talk, what I want to talk about. Um, so what I'm going to go into is actually plays very off of what, well what Kasha dis discussed from now thinking about the, the, some of the problems that may arise in data, getting a little bit more specific around how these problems actually arise in real world data sets. And in particular, what me and my group, what we're really interested in is understanding electronic health records data and how those produce challenges and biases for development of, of AI tools and clinical decision support. So next slide. Um, just to acknowledge, I get funding from um, government agencies, and then a lot of this work is actually based on a student of mine, Meng Ying Yan, and acknowledge her work there. Next slide. So the current state for clinical decision support tools, for the most part, really over the past five to 10 years has been the use of electronic health records data. The, the typical workflow is that developers use machine learning algorithms. They can be very simple. They can be very complex to aggregate lots of patient clinical factors and turn that into a single risk score. That clinical decision support is then used to supplement the providers. This can be doctors, nurses, care managers, clinical decision gestalt for the best course of action. And one thing that's really important to be cognizant as you think through this workflow is that this is just one piece of information that's being thrown at what are admittedly very overworked, very stressed and caregivers. And they have to aggregate this information into other understanding they have of this patient that's in front of them. And while we can often identify which factors are important in the risk score, we usually can't specify which factors are, are specifically driving the individual's risk. So there's always this little bit of a risk of a black box component where it's not going to be clear why is the score telling that decision maker what they should and should not do. Next slide. So I actually always help, find it helpful to actually just understand what the electronic health record is. Um, for those who haven't um, looked at one ever, um, the next time you're at your doctor's office, I'd really encourage you to just ask them to, to show you the screen that, that they're typing into, because it really becomes a, a really interesting way for, for how in, information is distilled down. So this is actually a, a, a fake screenshot of the, the EHR that we have here at Duke. And there's a lot of really interesting components going on here, but the the aspect that I want to really highlight is both a positive and a negative here is that there's information that's being put in by a provider, a doctor, a nurse, someone is deciding what information to put in. And that has both the extreme advantage for someone like myself, where I can actually go to doctors, I can go to providers and say, why did you input that information? Explain to me your, your decision-making process. But what it also means is that there was a decision-making process that occurred, that there was selective information that was chosen to be input based on the type of care that the doctor or the provider decided that that patient needed. And what I'm gonna to try to talk a little bit about is how those decisions can potentially actually create biases in the algorithm, um, in, 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 the, in the rules that our algorithms may learn. Next slide. So this question of why we want to use EHR data for, for prediction models, um, there's a lot of reasons for this. The data are, are readily available. That's the number one reason for me. I have access to information on millions of patients, um, information collected over a variety of domains. I can study many different clinical outcomes. But the real core, the real reason why I prefer working with EHR data for, for these types of problems, as opposed to say clinical trials data or epi cohort data, is that it's representative of a, of a real population and reflective on whom and how care will be delivered and received. And in many ways, that can't be, uh, um, the importance that can't be understated. We want the data that we're using to actually to actually look like the way we're going to give care. It's wonderful to have a really robust data set, but if you incorporate information into that that really aren't ever going to be collected in clinical practice, it's not really that useful. So this is real information and, and reflective of how care is given. On the next slide. But there's obviously reasons why we may not want to use these data for clinical research, and it really boils down to the fact that these data are not organized for research purposes. The data exists in disparate places. All patients have different pieces of information. And what I just said as the advantage is really also the, the, the key barrier here. The data are representative of the way care is delivered and, and received. And the care may not always be delivered and received in a systematic way. Next slide. So this kind of brings to, to the, the research question that our group has been particularly interested in is, is representative data a good thing? 
And unfortunately, there has been a lot of documentation in the literature that there are systematic differences in the way healthcare is, is delivered and received. So there are differences in, in health system utilization. There are racial ethnic differences in the usage of, of emergency departments. There's racial and ethnic differences in the types of hospitals patients are transferred to. There's also differences in how care is received and documented. Females are less likely to be diagnosed with myocardial infarction. Whites receive more expensive care than African Americans. And then there's, and there's even differences in, in the performance of tools, as Cassio just alluded to. Um, pulse oximetry has been shown to perform worse in African Americans. There's suggestion that, that mammograms may perform worse in, in Asian women. So as an aggregate, the information that we see in, in these real world data sets are often the reflection of biases in terms of the way care is, is delivered and received. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about our two ways that algorithmic bias can ensue through this process. So the first is this notion of differential observability. And observability is actually a big informatics concept and really refers to what it is that we see and why do we see certain things. And if, so if the observability of our outcome of interest is incomplete, our algorithms are, will be biased. If, I don't, if I'm trying to predict who is going to end up in the hospital, but I don't have complete capture of who goes to the hospital, I'm not gonna learn that true risk. Now more so if, if of particular concern today is if that observability of the outcome is differential on some factor, for example, race, our algorithms will become differentially biased. So our, our algorithms will be more accurate in one group versus another. And it's this, con it's this concept of, uh, of differential bias based through differential observability that we're really interested in. And what we really want to be thinking about is then, well, what does that mean? And what are the implications for our AI tools? And what we've been looking at and finding is that we only want to include a variable in our model that impacts the true outcome, not the observability of our outcome. So if something like race or, or, or sex is associated with the likelihood of seeing that outcome, we don't want to include those in our models. But, if, but if, if race or sex is actually associated or really a causal factor for outcome, that's when we want to do that. Let's go to the next slide. So this is more kind of a, of a pictorial way of thinking about this. Um, we may have some sensitive variable. Um, it may impact either the, the true unobserved outcome and it, or it may impact our observed outcome. And so we only want to include the variables that truly affect the outcome. But the biggest problem here is that we can't test for this because this is based on unobserved factors. So we actually need to make this assumption. Next slide. Um, we can also think about genesis of algorithmic bias through proxy variables. Sometimes what we see isn't quite what we want. There may be things that are in the EHR that, we're not, that is not good at capturing, things like social determinants of health or aggregated health status. And instead we use proxy variables for this, like um, race or insurance status for, as a proxy for SES, healthcare utilization as a proxy for overall health. Next slide. And again, we can create, a, we can end up in, in a problematic scenario where we have some observed proxy variable, for example, race. It, we want to believe that it's following the blue arrow path of, 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 of impacting SES and what we care about is capturing SES, but it may actually be the case that our, our proxy variable is really impacting things that we don't want to be including into our model, for example, these service utilization patterns. And again, these are things that we can't test for, we can't ever know in our data, we just have to make assumptions about it. Next slide. So this creates a perpetuating problem where there's some inequitable delivery of care. This leads to a, a differential capture of patient outcomes. The algorithms learned then have differential performance. The clinical decision rules that differentially will direct care, cre uh, creating what we often call algorithmic fairness, and then creating again an inequitable delivery of care. Next slide. So thinking about this, this gets us into this larger question of, of, of missing data. Now, missing data typically implies that data should be there but aren't. But really with EHR data, most information that are not there were never intended to be collected. Again, going back to the example of EHR, what's only there is what the provider deems as necessary. So we actually refer to this as informed presence, a collection of factors that makes what we observe informative. And therefore, typical strategies like imputation are not going to be appropriate. Next slide. So this, so not to kind of talk too much in the next topic, but how do we really think about this? So we begin thinking about how we address these observability concerns by constructing cohorts or data elements with better observability. This may be creating local patients or, um, or that have regularly use the health system using data elements where we really understand why certain things are documented. Next slide. 
So as a final take home, we kind of would hope to get through this is that EHR data are a central data source for clinical decision supports. For all their richness, we don't observe everything we want to. And then therefore biases in how healthcare is delivered and received will lead to differential capture of information. This leads to biased algorithms that can ultimately perpetuate biases in the deli delivery of care. But the real key that we're really discovering is that many of these challenges are unverifiable within the data themselves and are assumptions that algorithm developers ultimately need to make. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ben. Um, so now we're gonna turn to our reactants to the session um, for their opening remarks, but then also as a reminder, and I see that some people have started to put some questions in in the, the Q&A on Zoom function, um, but certainly encourage people to submit questions there. We're gonna have some time after this for an open discussion uh, following these remarks. So first, um, turn it over to Pilar. And do we have- Hi, uh, sorry, it yeah. was, it's not letting me start my video, only my audio. <laughs> Okay, well, we can. Ah, okay, you. now I've got the code. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I've, I've been promoted. <laughs> All right. Um, so I don't have any slides, and I think I'm going to be relatively quick here. I'm Pilar Osorio. Um, and a very little bit about me. I began my career as a bench scientist. And then after my postdoc, I switched to a career in law and bioethics. Um, and I, I want to say I, I loved all those talks. It is super difficult to convey complex concepts in a very short time. And I thought all three of the speakers did a fabulous job of that, um, as did Christina in her sort of framing. So thank you. Um, so I guess my first comment, I just want to make clear that I think all of us are, you know, critics of a kind of pernicious bias in AI. But that criticism shouldn't be interpreted as a call to avoid the use of AI or machine learning in healthcare. So of course, one reason, as I think came across in the talks, that one reason for the bias in, in our models is that they're learning on real world data that have been patterned by existing racism and classism and gender bias and other kinds of bias. Um, so bias exists and it's damaging people's health and healthcare, whether or not we use AI. Um, so we're not looking at a situation where we're comparing biased AI to oh, an unbiased world, right? We're actually trying to um, improve both the world and the AI. So even though there's also bias in the world and in healthcare delivery, um, that's not an excuse to say, well, you know, we should just go forward with our biased AI because look, there's bias everywhere, right? We do have obligations grounded in justice to fix bias, um, both in the world when we can, and also in our AI when we can. Um, and it's not easy to fix bias in software and machine learned models, but it's probably easier to fix bias in an algorithm to, than to change people's behavior or to change um, important, significant, deeply entrenched social structures, right? So, um, so we're not saying just get rid of AI and healthcare because it's biased, but we're also not saying we should just continue on letting it be biased. If we can fix it, we should fix it. Um, I also wanna say, and I think this started to come out in Ben's talk a bit, that uh, Christina defined bias as significantly different performance in different subgroups, but that is not the same as having an algorithm that um, has different outcomes on average for people of different subgroups, like different genders or races. Um, and so the way Ben framed it was that if race or sex is causally related to an outcome that we need to, to observe and respond to, then we do want our AI to recognize that. Um, so I think that's right. Uh, and this is one of the real difficulties in uh, using AI in healthcare as opposed to in other contexts, I think it can sometimes be hard to know whether differential outcomes or differential sort of treatment by the algorithm reflects some group-based difference in health or in response to medication or something like that versus um, reflects 
bias in the training data or something. So I just want to be clear that not it's not the case that every time an algorithm treats people different, somewhat differently by group, that it's um, necessarily biased and that having different outcomes by group is not the same thing as having poor performance in some subgroups or significantly poor performance. The algorithm could be performing well and seeing something that's real. I think we have to be careful when we see those real things and that's when um, questions about the human component uh, come in, right? <laughs> so when we think about um, uh, algorithms, we can't only think, we can't think about them in the vacuum, right? They are actually, their outcomes are implemented by practitioners and healthcare systems. Um, the choice to use them is made by people, right? And so um, we also have to have ways of, of communicating the results uh, in, such that we don't exacerbate or play into existing bias. So I'm basically out of time. I'm gonna say one more thing. Um, and this is in response to Kaja's presentation, which I just love. I'm a huge fan of her work. Um, so I just wanna point out that there are really important policy and regulatory implications in, in her um, discussion about the need to produce some kind of report about the nature of the data that was used to train a model and the nature of the training. Um, so some of the implications are exactly what information should accompany every model, what format should that information be in, where should people go to find that information. And you know, through various policy levers, we can incentivize actors in who are developing health-related AI to do what she was describing. And through regulations, we can require it. But one issue here is that um, I think as Christina made clear, there are lots and lots of ways in which AI is used in the healthcare system. And um, only a small subset of AI for healthcare is for instance, regulated by the FDA as a medical device. A great deal of AI that could have significant impacts on the quality of people's healthcare is not very much regulated by anybody right now. And so we might have to think for, we might have to look to more um, soft policy solutions like accrediting to incentivize people to adhere to um, standards with respect to describing data and model training. So with that, I will stop and pass it on. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Pilar. Um, and then our, our second reactant is uh, Shaman. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shaman. It's an honor to be uh, part of this panel. Uh, as a disclosure, I'm a full-time employee of Edwards Life Sciences. Opinions expressed here are solely my own and do not express the views of uh, my employer. Uh, thank you so much for Christina by presenting and framing the discussion and three presenters, three panelists for their great presentation. I truly enjoyed their presentations. Uh, regarding the second presentation by Kaja, uh, usually we provide data label when we publish a paper or when we submit uh, basically documents to regulatory regarding our data. So I'm curious to learn through this panel how the data label that she's referring to is different from what we see as a table one in most papers when they explain you know, gender and ethnicity of their uh, patient population. But I totally agree that for every work we need to share data label. And since uh, peer review journal usually are the source in order to advance the field in the field of AI in healthcare, I believe we need to ask uh, others now to provide a, a section about AI fairness, rather than focusing only on improving the performance, getting to the high accuracy or high F1 score. I believe it's great to encourage uh, scientists to also report uh, the fairness of their AI algorithm. And we ask them to clearly communicate the limitations of their algorithm. And in the third presentation by Benjamin, one of the points 
that uh, I want to highlight, usually we, usually EHR companies, electronic health record company, process the data before entering them into the uh, EHR. So it's also important to know and understand what was the type of processing that was done on the data before going into the EHR and how it can impact the uh, fairness on the data. And also, uh, my last point, I work on AI algorithm that use directly by physician to help patient. And currently we are developing AIs that could help to uh, basically enhance design of some products that indirectly have impact on the patient. So it's also important to know the severity of AI fairness and how uh, AI fairness can impact the patient cells. If it's directly used by patient, definitely the impact is higher. If it's indirectly, then we also need to identify the risk for the patient. I believe this is a very important topic, and we also need to encourage all researchers to focus on fairness in addition to focusing on performance of their machine learning model. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so thank you, Simon, for your remarks. And uh, now we're going to start the open discussion time. So we have about 25 minutes. Um, and so certainly people, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll be pulling from there. And then, and then also looking for uh, discussion between our panelists. So I think if all our panelists can turn on um, their cameras and I'll just lead off with a question and, and then go from there. And, and actually, um, Asha, the question I had for you is, is uh, I love seeing the data related to the dermatology, um, the dermatology images, and, and there's been so much work uh, specifically in dermatology and radiology and other ones where there's a lot of imaging data. Um, one thing from the past two years is there's so much more um, remote kind of telemedicine going on and, and uh, clinical interactions that are occurring um, using images and using kind of interactions with patients that are, are not kind of where we have the, the past data. And I, I wondered um, when you talk through that with the dermatology data and saying that a lot of the bias comes in when we have a lack of training data, what your thoughts are in terms of um, kind of the new way that providers are interacting with patients and whether that is going to be in, in, in bringing in additional biases um, that we just really don't have any data to, to train on. Oh man, that's a, starting with a tough one. Um, yeah, and uh, and thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, I, I I'm not a, an expert in, in image data sets in medicine, so I should, I should lead with that. I do think though that um, more data does address some of the problems, right? So if you have underrepresentation or you have communities that are not as well represented or misrepresented, certainly more data can help, um, but that's not the only problem. And I think that that's why it's really important to highlight what we know about that data um, and as we're getting more and more of it, I mean, something like GPT or some of the other data sets that are not image based, but are enormous out there also still have problems because the reality is that when we are taking snapshots of the world, we're going to capture things like historical biases and social biases um, as well. So I think small data or limited data um, is a problem and maybe that will become, um, you know, uh, We'll see that less as we as we gather more data in this in this age of telemedicine. We're taking lots of data and samples and sending them as images, um, but it's not going to fully address the issues we would see um, as you know with regards to other types of biases that are just reflective of the world around us. Um, and so I think that that's why uh, you know our focus should be on reducing bias. But the reality is there is no non-biased data set. There's no non-biased algorithm. Um, right, because if if we were really going for something that was entirely non-biased, I think we would flip a coin for everything, and that is not what we're doing, right? And that's overly simplistic, but I think you get my drift. Um, so I would say that the most important thing there is to know your data, and to look at it, and to not be afraid to try to understand the nuances in that data, and um, 
and communicate that. And I think it gets to a question that Saman had about how is this different from a table one in the paper? I'd say that's awesome that you do that. Not everybody does. <laughs> so um, it's about standardization and it's about having a common language and a framework to communicate the known issues and the mitigation strategies, even as we, do, we reduce some biases, I'm sure we will see an increase in others. I, to, I actually want to jump off really quickly off of what they said is that it's not about removing biases. I, I think if we go into this saying that we are, we will get to an unbiased place where, where it, it won't exist and, you know, and there, there's this damned if you do, damned if you don't component. And I think part of his understanding, well, what are the lesser of evils sometimes? What is the best approach? And then being able to, to articulate where we think those biases may lie so that we can effectively communicate that to decision makers so they can ultimately make more informed choices about and understand the context of the algorithm within those larger biases. Yeah, no, and following up on that, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of the test that you're saying, you know, all all models, all, all, all data sets are imperfect and it really is how you use them and, and making sure that you're clear about your assumptions and transparent and making, um, you know, understanding kind of that they are part of the you know, piece of decision making that the user would make that you be uh, both transparent and understanding of what the, the quality is of the that. Um, and actually Ben, with you thinking about the, the EHR data, and you touched on this that really um, it's a, such a huge amount of data that's in there. It's like real data, it's kind of how interactions are happening with patients. But even then, it's still only getting at what rose to the level to actually be documented. It's not even saying that it rose to the level to be discussed in the room because these things that are get discussed don't actually get all of these things. And also, I guess the other limitation is that it's really um, a look at. You know that one component is from the healthcare. So as we move into kind of a world where there's so much more that goes on outside of the hospital, outside of the inpatient clinic, and you know not only within the health sector but other sectors, the things that are happening in the education system or the judicial system. That, um, how do you? I guess how do you think about um, the biases? The biases within the HR data that are just even that are just so large at when you're trying to really get at the the true the true health of a of an individual or a population. Yeah, no, and, and I think, and that's a great challenge, right? It's, it's how do we d disentangle through that? And what I would say, and, and I think, I feel like Kasha is maybe alluding to this a little bit, is that the as we get more and more data where I see the advantages and opportunities with big data sets are not to necessarily analyze millions of records, but to actually construct better cohorts and to say, because I only have 100 people, I have to analyze the 100 people in front of me, flaws and all, but I can say I have a, a million people at my disposal, I can aggregate down to the 1,000, 10,000 person data set that I actually have a lot of faith in. And that's a lot of the work that we'll start thinking about and really pulling from more of an epidemiologic perspective of what, which data do we, I believe in which samples do I think are really representative and accurately captured? And let me re remove those samples that I may have some concerns about. And I think that's really where the opportunity arises, not just simply saying, we're gonna take everything that comes to us and just run it through our models, but that pre-processing of who do I wanna use, what records are, are valuable is, is where we can begin to, to mitigate those. And actually, um, kind of following on that with Chris, when you brought up the kind of the type three era, the, the really are we asking the right questions? I think, I think that that push for making sure that we're asking the right questions is something that all of you have, have touched on in your presentations. And I guess wanting to kind of push on that thread a little bit in terms of how do we help. Um, how do we help uh, healthcare providers, help policymakers, patients? How do we help them in terms of recognizing the right questions and also recognizing the right algorithms and data that can help answer those questions? Uh, thank you for that. So, uh, if, if anybody had challenge hearing, it was a, a matter of 
there's healthcare leaders, there's decision makers, there's people involved who aren't buried in algorithms and, and researching these papers all day, but they want to do well for their populations and, and, and make the appropriate decisions. So it's a question of how do we educate them and how do we guide them into, uh, in, in, into, in, into answering those questions correctly? Uh, well, in, in, into asking the right questions and, and holding the data science teams or vendors that they're working with accountable. That's actually a, a big focus of my work is on the data science communication aspect. So uh, a, a big, uh, there, there's a big gap when you have people who are primarily focused on uh, dealing with uh, data issues and very versed in the SQLs and Pythons are and, and things like that versus the people who are, uh, are making decisions that want to make the right decisions, but don't understand uh, like where these perspectives uh, uh, could come from or aren't even aware of the fact that uh, bias could arise. So there, there's a very important uh, component here of communicating with healthcare leaders, of educating them about these resources, of uh, providing uh, 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 e easy to understand heuristics and thinking kind of from their world of strategy, uh, 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 communicating in a way that, that like a, a lot of the conversations that I've had are first on making sure that people are aware of the problem in the first place. So there's a lot of education on, hey, here's the gravity of the problem, here's the impact, here's what we observed in your own data, and here are the corrections that we uh, had to go through to, to make sure that your like our use case is on outreach. So here's what we had to do to make sure that we were delivering equitable outreach. Uh, then the, the, there uh, come even deeper questions. So like what, what I wanted to highlight in that, in that presentation is that they're like outside of data science, you have strategy, how the organization's being guided. And I, I didn't talk as, uh, as much on end user training and how people actually, um, but like, like you, you deploy an algorithm, you've gone past the deployment phase, great job, but how are people actually using it? Is the, are, are they still perpetuating the same bias they were comfortable with? Are they ignoring the outputs? There's education required at the leadership level to make sure they're making the right decisions. And then at the operational level to uh, make sure that, hey, here, here's why we came, uh, uh, came to this conclusion and why you came, came to these outputs. And here's how you should treat these cases based on the outputs from the model. Wonderful, thanks. Um, and now actually turning to a question that came in from the audience. Uh, so this is asking, and let me have uh, Pilar, maybe you start with your response, is, is whether accurate prediction helps to perpetuate disparity. So asking the example is that income might be predictive of health outcomes, but including income as an explore, uh, explanatory factor effectively justifies that lower income people should have more outcomes. And so want to get your thought on that. Pilar, you're oh, on mute. Pilar, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You'd think I would figure that out by now. Um, so this goes to a point that started to come up earlier about making causal inferences, right? Race and ethnicity, for instance, are almost never and, and really almost never going to be biologically causal in the sense that there's something intrinsic to being a person of a certain race that is biologically causal of a health outcome. Instead, it's, you know, some of those bigger social identities um, on which so much social inequality is patterned, um, you know, the causal factors will be things like uh, inequality and in income levels, inequality and in education levels, all kinds of things that might not be captured directly in a data set. Now, um, so first of all, I think whether or not you are perpetuating or exacerbating existing inequality will depend in part on what question you ask and whether you ask the right question. And also on some of the issues that just came up, which is how are end users educated about the, the biases, quirks, et cetera, in, their, in the algorithms that are deployed, right? Um, so I think um, to the extent that end users have kinds of assumptions about things like gender and race and, and health outcomes that may reflect bias, we need to be careful that we don't that they don't just use the algorithms um, in ways that 
perpetuate those existing biases, right? And so again, this goes back to, you know, the algorithm is being used by humans and deployed by humans that so we have to understand the human piece of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, other thoughts from folks or before I turn to another question? Yeah, so what I would say also about that is it's really important to remember that any CDS tool is a means to an end, that the end is not the prediction, but it's real, but it's, it's the delivery of some kind of care. So here at Duke, when we think about this from a governance standpoint, if we're assessing the potential for algorithmic bias of a model, we'll look at its performance in different groupings, but we'll also look at what type of care is being delivered. And do we see some, mm -hmm. some differential delivery of care? So I don't think there's necessarily inherently wrong with saying that one group is at higher risk of something versus another group, but if that leads to the delivery of, of preferential care for those groups in a way that doesn't seem clinically justifiable, that's that's where really we get into those notions of algorithmic fairness that become that really is where the perpetuation of, of, of inequities begins. So one of the questions, and, and uh, we can have any of the panelists jump in with a response here is, is really, are there any common or easily avoidable scenarios? Because, so, you know, are there things that we can just make sure at the, at the start we're, we're not doing or, or in order to kind of be helping with bias? And then, um, and, and I guess some of this might get at um, Asha, where you started with the kind of that checklist of, of things to be looking at when you're looking at the quality of an algorithm or bias. Um, and so I guess one thing was trying to think about has that been operationalized in a way to, to help people say, okay, these are things I can start with and then and then go from there and getting at some of the more nuance. Yeah, I can jump in. I'd love to hear what others think as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I think, um, and I think uh, the, the word operationalize is really uh, important here because as, um, as I think Chris was saying, AI is a socio-technical system. It's not just a technical system, right? And so the socio part, I think, is where um, a lot of opportunity lies. And, and it's the blending of the two. So if you have a checklist or something uh, that um, just helps you look for the largest signs of potential areas with your training data, for example, um, operationalizing that in the socio context is probably going to be hard, but is crucial. So if you are the CEO of a company or the head of a group making time and space and actually putting resources towards these tasks and not just assuming that the product manager or the data scientist is going to do them on top of their work because they care. Right, like it's like any kind of work that is seen as extra, it should actually be incorporated. So it should be part of the job description, there should be a role, there should be time and space in the process to actually do this. A good, a good analogy I like to use is the software development life cycle. And I don't know if this is the right audience for that, but in software development, there are um, many areas where people are looking for issues. So when you first create this, I think it's a, again, a, a phenomenal point that you have to be, um, you're looking to predict the right thing. Right. So an example of this might be uh, I've just I was just working with somebody who is building a system that is predicting whether you look like a certain patient because they did a thing. And that is probably the wrong metric, because what you actually want to do is um, model whether somebody looks like they would benefit from something, not that they looked like someone else who did a thing. Right. So. Um, that's very abstract, but do you have the right metric? You want to set aside time for that. In software development, that would be your specs, like your product specs. And then once you've built the code, you need to actually test for it, right? In software development, this would be unit tests or commenting your code or something like that. And once you actually deploy the thing, it's not done. Like we have our iPhones, we expect updates. We should expect the same thing of our AI. We should expect that once it is in the world, that is the beginning. The launch is the beginning of the life of the AI, not the end, right? So I think these are the kinds of things that when you're talking about operationalizing, to me, it's the socio part. It's the context around the kind of implementation of these known technical elements that are not hard, but just need to be standardized and routinely followed. That would be my answer to that. I'd love to hear what other people think. I just wanted to chime in with another thought, especially uh, let's let's building off of the uh, context that AI is a socio uh, technical platform. So an, another uh, aspect of that, like if we, if we get away from just looking at it at pure technology and pure technological issues, uh, one thing that, that's extremely common, like if you look at the 
leadership and boards of a lot of, uh, or just the development process of a lot of uh, organizations that are developing algorithms for, for whatever case, uh, there should be clinical involvement as well. So uh, outside of uh, like outside of the technical issue is like my background is in data science and analytics and things like that. And uh, the, the first thing that I'm seeking, like uh, let's say that we're asked to uh, develop some uh, like develop some standard or, or uh, like an approach, I'm thinking about how we partner with uh, uh, with a clinician to identify what like like if they're, they're, I can't just Google a list of ICD-10 codes that are pertinent. I want to uh, talk to somebody that has expertise and and bring bring that into mm -hmm. uh, like again starting at that strategy, starting at that, that very top level, incorporate real clinical knowledge into the the systems that we're building. Wonderful, and, and, thank you. And in real Come application, on, we yes, uh, in real application, we usually just show the outcome of machine learning or AI algorithm on the screen. Recently, people are showing uh, basically how to interpret the results. I feel we need to have another component to show uh, some statement on how fair is the algorithm. And basically we need to show um, fairness, uh, basically metrics besides the result that we are showing to end user too. And I, I would add, I, I agree with that. Um, so I think other things we can do, not just train and test, but actually experiment, right? Study the algorithm, push it, see where it breaks. Um, the problem with that is that it's not so easy in many cases, in part because despite the deluge of data that uh, Chris referred to, um, it can be difficult for developers to get access to an independent data set um, of, of, of the type that they really need, which might be um, electronic health record data, for instance. So um, I make that recommendation. I don't actually think it would be an easy recommendation to follow in all cases. And the other thing, and this kind of follows what Kaja was saying, but I just want to emphasize, is that once it's deployed, we still need to monitor its performance after it's deployed in the real world. It, so it's, that's, as she said, as, as they said, part of the life cycle. And, um, and, and I think there hasn't been emphasis on that and there's not a culture of doing that kind of monitoring, so. I actually wanna jump off of that point because I, I completely agree with Pilar that, that it's, that we, we can't just deploy things and then assume that it's it stays just after there, and even if it, it performs well now, that tomorrow it, it it will continue to perform well. I mean, and that's something I think that as a field we've started to even recognize with the pandemic, see and starting to look at well, how has it broken our tools? Can we still use our our mortality risk scores, our readmission risk scores in the context of some fraction of our patient populations, our COVID patients, and they're really different. So I think it, it's starting to become part of the lexicon where we say we need to know as our our systems change and evolve as our data streams are change and evolve as our the the u, billing reimbursement patterns that prioritize the use of different diagnosis codes are will change the way of who gets certain diagnoses will change all of our input data and will have unknown effects on our ai and and, and we, we have to be, we, there needs to be a constant vigilance then to be looking at what's going on and having systems and tools in place for that monitoring. Yeah, and for, for folks who are thinking, well, what should we be monitoring? Um, you know, I'd say look in, in kind of two directions to begin with. One is model drift. So have certain model performance metrics that you're looking at and, and launch those with your model. Think of them before you launch your model. <laughs> launch them with your model and look at them routinely. And the second is data shift, right? So model drift and data shift. And this kind of gets to something that Pilar said, which is that um, you might not have a lot of independent data when you're building the model, but as soon as it's out in production, you will get lots of data because it will be getting used and you will now have all of that data that's coming in. And so looking to see how what you you expected for the model and also what you expected for the distribution of data and outputs, watching those carefully and looking at them routinely. Um, that's kind of a good place to start. But we have many scenarios when a team deploy a model, they don't have access to the device that is running the model in a hospital. So monitoring mm -hmm. many situation is difficult because you deploy, users start using it and monitoring is 
impossible because there is no feedback loop. Versus the cases on your smartwatch, you can give a consent to development team to continuously monitor your data and use it for further improvement versus a case that you run some algorithm on a bedside monitor, for example, in a hospital. Um, I think that's so, a great that's a great point, and I, I think there are analogies like if you think about cars that are sold and then they're out there running, right? We still know when something goes wrong with those cars, there are recalls and things like that. So I agree that there are challenges, but I don't think they're insurmountable. It just means we have to think of it as a as a system and not as a technical thing that is deployed off the lot. Never think about it again. Sorry to cut in. No, 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 that's that's great. And actually, kind of continuing on this, I know Simon that you use AI in product development rather than Kind of AI as a product. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how biases in algorithms impact the development and testing of other medical products um, and where good AI can help build better products. So in our case, a good thing is we are using AI to enhance our products, for example. And we could have continuous monitoring in that case to identify when there is a drift as my colleagues mentioned, so in that case, we could quickly fix any drift that we see in a model performance, especially if it's related to, uh, you know, for example, ethnicity or gender. So we have more control in a development phase, but in the previous company, we were deploying solution to bedside monitor. So in that case, definitely was more difficult to fix uh, drift in the data. So what we have here is really we have continuous monitoring to make sure the model is continuously performing well and the feedback that we are sharing is always correct and is not biased. Okay, great. Um, and actually here, we just had a comment, a question come in um, on, in terms of reevaluating models once they're deployed. So could could panelists comment on whether you see funding resourcing shortages as a challenge in pursuing the kind of post-market performance versus, you know, kind of moving on to the next shiny object? And so what is the, what are potentially some of those barriers? I think, yeah, I mean, it, I think there's a cultural shift that's needed because I, I think that the questioner is right, that there is this focus on, on the shiny new object. I'd say one of the things that we're starting to appreciate here from a governance standpoint is complicated models are not really desirable and that a little bit of added benefit in AUC from a, a sophisticated deep learning model with 100 inputs is not actually better than a very simple regression model that has mm -hmm. five or 10 inputs because the maintenance of it, the monitoring, the, the interpretability of it is so much larger in that simpler model that we're actually preferencing those types of algorithms for these exact reasons. So I think it's important to, you know, for certain problems to play in that space to have very complicated tools, but when a simpler solution is available, it, it, it those, I think we need to be open to those approaches, even if it's not the shiny new object. You know, uh, Ben, I, I like that approach because it, uh, it's again another example i pointed one out in, in the chat but uh it's focusing on what's valuable is getting uh, like getting to an uh, uh like getting to an ethical outreach perspective but then what's viable so mm -hmm. if we pursue things that are based on data sets that we're not going to be getting on a recurring basis or long term and it is expensive to maintain that then there is that risk of uh, the next shiny object takes away the needed attention so at the very beginning uh, like Cyril, that 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 risk should be considered from the very beginning. And in order to address that, it's a it's a focus on simplicity and a focus on adoption and a focus on do we have long term access to this data and can we, can we uh, run it on a repeat basis? Or even like when it comes to how that funding is acquired, like whether it's a capital expenditure or operational, uh, we, we'd want to get it closer to the operational perspective so that mm -hmm. it's uh, delivered on a, on a repeating basis. Yeah, I, think I also those. think there's a, sorry. Oh, I was gonna say there's a question of who pays, right? Because if you're a healthcare system and you're deploying algorithms, you have some obligation to be monitoring their deployment as well. And so some of the payment might come from the healthcare system and some might come from the developer and licensor of the product and figuring out who pays. Uh, also figuring out how do we incentivize people to pay and to create the systems for monitoring. And that's where I think um, in many cases, things like the 
organizations that accredit healthcare systems might play a really important role. Yeah, kind of jumping right off of that, I think procurement is such an opportunity. So mm -hmm. we're kind of talking about from the from the perspective of people who are developing these things, how do we get them funded? Well, what if it was required, right? What if what if our funding actually came in tranches and their milestones and in the procurement packages it says that then you will get this money for the for the update and the maintenance because now it isn't that we're scrambling to look for money to support that because we know it's right, but it's that it's actually captured in the requirements and the value that the organizations that are funding this actually want to see. Right. So it kind of gets to what Ben was saying a little bit about we need to we need to shift. It's a cultural shift in terms of where we believe the money should be allocated, where we believe the value is. Yeah, I, I, and, and, and I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, you, 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 okay. Well, I was just going to say we're going to need to to wrap it up. But actually, I think what what the panelists is is are doing right now are trying to kind of get to what session two is and is really looking for some of these solutions and how do we actually what are our you know, procedures for preventing and mitigating and detecting bias? And, and, and then also what are some of the kind of policy implications or solutions as well? And so um, I do want to thank our session uh, one participants. Um, we're now actually going to have a 30 minute break and then we're going to resume discussion at 1 p.m. Eastern with our session two. But thank you so much to all the panelists. And this has been a wonderful conversation and we'll talk again soon. Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed your break uh, and what a great session one we had. I'm excited to be starting up session two. You can go to the next slide. For those of you who are just joining us, my name is Christina Silcox. I'm the Digital Health Policy Fellow here at the Keith Margolis and I'll be moderating our next session. In our next, next session, uh, Procedures for Preventing, Mitigating and Detecting Bias in Healthcare AI, we're gonna continue our discussion on how bias arises in AI. However, our speakers are going to be focusing specifically on the approaches for detecting, mitigating, and preventing bias in AI healthcare software. I'd like to take a minute to introduce our panelists for this session. First, we're gonna have Ziad Obermeyer, Associate Professor and Blue Cross of California, Distinguished Professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Then we're gonna hear from Sarah Murray, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine and Associate Chief Medical Information Officer for inpatient care and data science at the University of California, San Francisco. And then we'll hear from Gigi Yuan, uh, Yuan Reed, who is the chief data scientist at IBM Watson Health. And then uh, Khadija Ferryman, who is a member of four faculty and an assistant professor of the Berman Institute for Bioethics at John Hopkins University. And then finally, we're going to hear from Eric Henry, uh, who's the senior quality systems and compliance advisor in, uh, in the FDA and life sciences practice of the law, law firm King and Spalding. He's also a member of the Xavier AI Health Initiative. So first I'm gonna turn it over to Ziad. Ziad? Thank you so much, Christina, and thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I thought a good place to start with some very brief remarks were the discussion questions that we are going to be taking on. So I'm just gonna walk through them um, almost in order because I think that sets up exactly what I wanted to do um, and, and the discussion that I'm looking forward to having with the other um, panelists. So I think the most important one for this conference and for this panel in particular is the first one, which is what policies do we want policymakers to put in place to mitigate and detect bias? Um, and in order to answer that question, I wanted to start by just walking through a very concrete example um, of an instance where, uh, where working with a team of researchers, we detected um, bias and were able to mitigate it. Um, and I think that there are, at least for me, a lot of lessons there that I took away from that example um, that I think are very relevant to policymakers as well. So it's almost like um, it's a parable of, of an algorithm that is used very widely in population health. Um, and the use case for that algorithm is really important to articulate because it was the key for us um, as we sought to detect whether or not that algorithm was biased. So this is in population health, a common problem. You've got a population of patients. You know that some of them are going to get sick, um, but a lot of them look okay today. And so your task is to figure out of this big population of patients, which one um, that I'm responsible for, both their health and financially, which ones are gonna get sick so that I can help them today. So there's a whole range of algorithms that are made um, by different companies and sold to health systems. Um, there are also some made by academic groups and they all, when we studied them, did approximately the same thing, which is to look ahead into the future and see how much a given patient was going to cost um, and use that to predict 
who needed healthcare today with the, the, the very sound logic that if someone was costing the healthcare system more, they were likely getting sick and going to the ER and going into the hospital and generating all of this utilization that we'd want to prevent. Um, and that prediction on cost was the key to prioritizing those people for help today. So this was the gatekeeper for access to extra help with your health for a range of chronic conditions. And what we found was that those algorithms, which are being used to make predictions and, and affect medical decisions for 150 million people every year in this country, um, contained large amounts of racial bias. So how we found that bias, I think, is very similar to how I'd suggest policymakers find that bias, which is to first define the problem that the algorithm is supposed to solve. Um, this is very similar to how um, at the FDA, they define an indication for a drug. You can't just get a drug approved for you know, health. Um, there has to be a particular indication that that drug is supposed to move. And then there's supposed to be a measurement strategy, which is the outcome that we look for in the clinical trial. So very similar to that for algorithms, we first need to figure out what is that algorithm supposed to be doing? Algorithms provide a decision maker with information. So we should be able to articulate, okay, well, what information do we want that algorithm to be providing? In this case, the way we are articulated that is we want the algorithm to predict who's going to get sick in the future. And that's what we held the algorithm accountable for. So what we found is that two patients who have the same likelihood of getting sick in the future, whether you define that with biomarkers or with um, exacerbations of chronic conditions, we looked at a variety of different definitions of that. But no matter which one you looked at, you found that the black patient um, was going to get scored lower by the algorithm compared to the white patient, even though they had the same likelihood of getting sick. And so that was how we defined bias. And that's how we made a case for it. And I think that case was very persuasive to a lot of people because a lot of those companies changed what they were doing in those algorithms and it attracted a lot of regulatory attention. So notice we didn't need to open the black box or figure out what the algorithm was doing to do this task. We just needed to say, we're gonna calculate the likelihood that someone gets sick or how sick they're gonna get. And then we're gonna look at how well the algorithm predicts that outcome by race. And that's how we concluded that was biased. So taking lessons, I think I I've already um, taken a lesson by analogy from drug policy, define the indication, define the outcome that drug is supposed to shift so we can measure it in a randomized trial. But I think there's also a great analogy to civil rights law. Um, and I'm currently doing work with um, some state attorneys general in different places where we're applying civil rights law that's very well established to define algorithmic bias and hold those algorithms accountable in very similar ways. So I think this approach is very parallel. The last thing I'll mention is that there's a lot of interest um, in what this means for the workforce of people in companies that are defining algorithms and using it. Of course, diversity is a really, really important thing um, to uphold. And I think what we've learned is that that's not enough. It's almost not radical enough. It's clearly important, but we also need to put clear accountability structures in place from the C-suite down to hold algorithms responsible inside of organizations. And a lot of the lessons that we took away from collaborations with lots of actors in health are in an algorithmic bias playbook, which is free to download um, and that hopefully we'll be able to post a link to. Thank you so much, Ziad. Uh, next, we're gonna to turn to Sarah. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, thank you. Um, that was great. And I agree with everything you said. So um, I serve as Associate Chief Medical Information Officer for Data Science at UCSF. And one of the things I do in my role is oversee implementation um, of uh, and deployment of predictive models in the health system. And this is actually a very challenging job because our stakeholders hear a lot about these vendor provided models that are marketed very well, such as models from Epic. And there's a lot of excitement and hype around what these models can do to improve care delivery. But what many folks don't understand, you know, outside of this forum is that um, because these, it's a largely unregulated landscape, you know, models don't have to be evaluated for trustworthiness prior to marketing. They haven't necessarily even been evaluated for bias. And so our team at UCSF is fortunate to have the resources to evaluate a lot of these models um, prior to implementation. And we've spent a fair amount of time um, doing that with a focus on um, a number of the EPIC models. And it's really changed how we think about um, best practices. So I wanted to also give you an example. Um, Epic has a model for predicting clinic no-show. Clinic no-shows are a big problem at UCSF. 
we have like a quarter million no-shows annually. It's a big problem for many health systems. And what many clinics do in the absence of models to mitigate the impact on clinic no-shows is actually overbooking at random. And so they'll just, you know, if you're a urologist and you're supposed to see 20 patients, they'll put 22 in and assume two will no-show. Um, and you'll see the right amount of patients and clinics will be available and they won't lose revenue. Um, but you can imagine that um, uh, you can imagine that like if two patients show up for an already short time slot, you have an overworked and stressed clinician and um, two patients potentially not getting the full care experience that they need. And so there's a lot of interest in models that can predict no show so that it can be used for targeted overbooking or you know, overbooking the patients predicted to be at greatest risk of no show. So when we unboxed um, Epic's version one of the model, it was immediately clear that we couldn't use it for this purpose. So the features um, for predicting no, no show in their model were primarily protected characteristics like race, ethnicity, marital status, where you adopted or not. Um, and it was clear we couldn't use it for that. So we rebuilt the model and we excluded everything, like all individual characteristics. And we only based our model based on um, you know, prior no-shows for that patient and then features of the appointment, like time of day, day of week, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, even, even doing so, we saw that um, the model still had different performance in different race ethnicity groups. And this makes sense for a couple of reasons, right? Like, first of all, we know society is biased and structural biases, structural racism, lead impact patients in ways that like maybe they don't have enough money for childcare or transportation to their appointment and they're more likely to to no show because of those reasons and then also you know interventions that were already in place like reminder calls maybe first of all being differentially applied to different race ethnicity groups or they may have different impacts on those groups and so what we initially did at UCSF was we said okay like we have this model it's clearly biased you all want a model um, let's implement this in a way that is only beneficial for patients. So you can use the model to try to figure out who might benefit from outreach and reminder calls. And, and it worked and we socialized that with our executive leadership and we saw, we saw um, some modest improvement in clinic no-shows, but what we learned a year or so later is we completely lost control of how the model was being used. And, and, and that was a lesson for me because it's a good reminder that you know, as developers, it's very difficult to control how a model is used. And so we have to think about building models in a way that really promote appropriate use while mitigating bias. Um, and that's something we're working on now as we uh, revamp our approach to no-show. So instead of predicting the outcome, like no-show, let's predict appropriate interventions that'll benefit the patients. And then we can assess the application of those interventions for bias. So for example, let's not predict no-show, um, hoping that you know our front clinic desk, the, the, the folks working at the clinic desks know what to do with that. Um, let's predict like who will benefit from conversion of their in-person visit to a video visit. Let's predict who needs a lift or, or their parking to be compensated. Let's predict um, who would actually just benefit from a reminder call. And so that's what we're working on now, really designing the questions in a way that mitigates bias and discrimination in the application. Thank you so much, Sarah. So, so what I hear from both of y'all is, is really that, that nuance, and, and this came up in session one too, that framing the question in a nuanced way, um, asking what you're actually asking and making sure that you're testing with with the outcome that you actually want, uh, not, not kind of an assumption around that, 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 that outcome. Uh, so great so far. Um, uh, next up is Gigi. Hello. It, wait a minute, it's not. You're on. I'm on, perfect. Yep. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure and I really enjoyed um, all the talks so far. Um, I um, am part of IBM Watson Health, and I am the chief data scientist responsible for our um, AI and algorithmic development. Um, and I think what I would do is talk about is what we do in our product development lifecycle in addressing the 
challenges around biases and fairness. Um, really, it comes down to, to three points. Um, one is aligning the use case intent to the model intent. And, and, and I wrote this note before I heard all the speakers, but it lined up with everyone. Like Chris talked about type three era, right? Solving the right question. Sia, you just had an awesome example of population health, how the model is intended to solve a problem that's being used. Um, and Sarah, I, I love the notion of really challenging the team to ask the right questions with equity in mind, right? Um, from, from my team standpoint, um, we definitely adopt these ideas um, conceptually, um, but the way we really roll it out in terms of the tooling is we adopt this um, framework called AI fact sheet, like the nutritional label for our AI model. And we do it in a disciplined way so that you're tracking what problem you're trying to solve, what data challenges you're running into, or your performance measure and so forth, every step of the development life cycle. Right. In the past, it's often an afterthought. Hey, we have this model, it's about to go on production. We're gonna have two clients gonna buy it. Let's make sure we test it. And say, no, 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 let's do it all the way. When we're doing conceptualization with the business and with the clinical leads, that's when we start really populating this fact sheet. And that becomes an instrument to ensure that we're disciplined. Because sometimes you just get so busy and you're running against the clock trying to deliver on a, on a schedule. And unless you have a tooling that you attract consistently, it's easy to lose track. So, so that has been helpful to us in terms of ensuring that we are marching towards the right goal. And as we are bringing in the data, as we're dealing with you know, challenges of noise and representation and scalability and all of that, we constantly keep in mind the, the intent. Um, the second piece is I think a lot of the panelists have talked about too is data awareness. Um, you know, really tracking the completeness and representation of the data that we use. Um, one, one challenge that I have, and I would love to speak with the wider team further is, um, oftentimes we do not have the data that we need to even do bias or fairness testing at the development phase. Right? A lot of the commonly used research data, research data set um, don't necessarily contain race, ethnicity, information. And even for geography, because of HIPAA rule, oftentimes it's rolled up to zip three, which really isn't granular enough for some of the um, evaluation that we would love to do. So that is a really practical challenge as we deal with every project. Um, there's a couple workarounds that we've explored. Um, one is to, um, before every deployment, we will take a pause and work with the end users on a pilot, right? where we pull in the live system data um, run this set of models in parallel to what they do um, in the day-to-day -day operation so that we can begin to observe how the models behave, not only just accuracy and precision and recall, but also in terms of bias and equity um, before the system is actually utilized for real-time decision-making. So, so we put in that as our best practice. Um, it's not often well-received, um, as we engage with commercial partners, because um, time is often an asset. So um, it, it is hard. <laughs> it would be a dream come true if we could think of as a community um, enriching these research data sets with more of the social demographic and detailed geographic information. Um, that would be something I would love to consider in the policy standpoint, right? Where perhaps we'll have built we have this data set with enriched information is available for us, even for testing or validation of what we built, right? Um, and we can, in that way, you know, make sure that a lot of the researchers and developments have access to that type of info. I think that's two, right? One is intent, two is data, and, and three is, is just technology, right? Doing that ongoing monitoring and so forth. Um, we do have challenges with representation. So um, we actually has been investing quite a bit of um, research, not, not just on AI 360, but um, doing really systematic and granular bias scan so that identifying subgroups who may have um, poor performance than others in terms of model precision or in terms of um, differential outcome, we can detect them in as granular way as possible. Because oftentimes when the data is already underrepresented, it's easy for the 
general methods to detect IS-2, let those subpopulations slip through. So um, having that automatic tooling has been helpful for my team. Um, again, right? Everyone's running against the clock, trying to deliver things on time, <laughs> trying to get their paper out. But having those automatic tooling easily accessible within our workbench has been, has been great. Um, I think I may be running out of time, but everything that I said, I don't think it's new to folks on this call, right? But one thing I do want to emphasize is so much of what they've talked about, like intent, data, and automatic scanning, right? All that has to be wrapped around with culture, culture and process. Um, culture, right, we talked about diversity, who's on the team and definitely not sufficient, is how we as a enterprise for me, encourage the behavior that we want to see, right? We make an effort to include considering bias and equity as part of our individual performance measure. It is in your annual report and you have an explicit conversation about, have you thought of that in your work? And if, if not, what can we do to help you to think of that some more, right? So really explicit um, people management tools um, and cultural tools um, to really drive that adoption. Um, and, then, and then a lot of culture is also coupled with processes. Right. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, right, how we integrate the notion of the fact sheet every step of the development life cycle, and really thinking about how to integrate this into a product release life cycle, um, and making that as you know, we don't release anything without going through a product checklist. This is one of the checklists that we have to go through. So just making it um, part of our everyday life. Thank you so much, Gigi. Uh, just a great uh, summary of how you think about it throughout the software development uh, cycle, um, which I, you know, I think is so important. You, obvious, you know, you do want to test for and rigorously test for bias at the end of the process, but certainly we'll, we would all be better off if there was ways of testing for issues early in the process, or uh, either through an automated test or through a series of thought uh, thought experiments, um, so that if you are going to end up with an algorithm that's going to be problematic, you fail early rather than late. Um, so thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, next up, I want to move to Khadija. Hi there. Um, excited to be here with everyone and um, the thoughts and ideas shared on the panel thus far have been great. And uh, Gigi, I, as a cultural anthropologist, I especially appreciate your emphasizing the importance of culture to all of this, to, to technology and technological development. So I'm going to talk um, specifically about uh, policy and, and even more specifically about FDA policy and how this uh, can relate to this topic today of um, addressing and mitigating uh, bias in AI that's used in health. So just a, a quick sort of overview. So the FDA has been regulating me medical devices since 1938, um, and there have been a number of de developments over the years in FDA's policy, uh, including the 1997 Modernization Act to the more recent 2016 21st Century CARES Act. And this uh, updated the FDA's ability uh, to implement expedited processes for new drugs and devices. And the FDA, the, the agency's specific regulation of software as a medical device has also evolved over the years. So AI is included in this definition of software as a medical device, although there are exclusions for AI um, that are not considered devices if they're used in hospitals for administrative functions and for disease, and for example, for disease prevention rather than um, disease diagnos diagnosis or treatment. But one shift that I think it's, uh, is important to highlight in this regulatory domain and sort of in this evolution of, of the FDA's regulation um, is the Digital Health Software Pre-Certification Program, or called Pre-Cert for short. And this, is, I think it's important to highlight this because it shifts the, the agency's regulatory attention to the software developer rather than to the technology. So here with a, this pre-cert program, the regulatory examination is of the developer's 
culture of quality and excellence. And I think this shift is important for us to consider, especially in light of what we're all concerned about and what we've been talking about today, the growing attention to the negative impacts of AI, particularly on marginalized groups. And that's because these discussions that we're having, which I think are important, fo focus on the device itself, right? How it functions, what its outputs are, if those are biased or affected groups differently. But the FDA's this pre-cert program is, is really sort of looking at the, not just at the device itself, but at the developer, at the company. And so in light of that, how might we, all of us as a community who are interested in bias and mitigating it and identifying it um, of the use of AI in health, how might, how might we shift or reorient our approaches, the questions we ask, and the examinations of the potential impacts of AI uh, if we focus not just on the devices themselves, but on the companies and developers, just as the FDA is doing with this pre-cert program. And I think it also presents this pre-cert program shift presents an interesting window into thinking about how regulatory regimes in general um, have to shift as technologies change, right? Because one of the challenges with regulating AI um, in health, specifically machine learning, is that the technology itself is often changing, right? And so normally under FDA, FDA regulation for other kinds of medical device devices, if your device changes, then it can be up for additional review. But how can you possibly review some Something like machine learning that's changing all the time. So the agency has drafted guidance for learning AI systems, but I also think, again, of this shift to focusing on regulating the company and not just the device is part of a strategy to res that responds to AI as a specific kind of technology, right, and, and, or, or ML in particular, as a specific kind of technology. So that's one thing that I'd like to put out here, um, put out for thinking and discussion today, how we might shift our concerns about bias, justice, health equity, to can if we are thinking or including in that the companies themselves and not just the uh, not just the devices. Um, one other issue just to, to bring up is that it might also be important to think of these fairness and equity issues for AI and health um, that lie outside of the FDA's regulatory domain. And a speaker earlier today mentioned that, right, that there are a number of AI devices that lie completely outside of the FDA's regulatory dom domain, right? And some of them might seem, you know, reasonable that, of course, they wouldn't be regulated by the company. But I think if we start to dig a little bit deeper, some of those exclusions, we might say, hmm, these actually do affect uh, people's care um, experiences of healthcare in ways that perhaps it should be regulated or uh, maybe if not part of the FDA's regulatory re regime, perhaps part of, a, a, of another um, kind of uh, regime. So I'll pause there. Thanks. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I think that, that we, we are going to dive more into how FDA could think about uh, AI products in a novel way. But, but again, exactly as you said at the end, um, how potentially third-party um, reviewers or, or other people might who, who might be trying to evaluate uh, these types of software that when where there isn't an FDA review um, might be might be able to do that. Uh, so I'm going to close out our opening remarks with Eric Henry. Thanks, uh, appreciate it, Christina. And um, uh, I, I'm actually really glad that you that you uh, uh, placed placed my my remarks after Khadija's because it laid some great groundwork for. What I think might be a, approaching this problem from a different angle. Uh, my background is in is in the medical device industry and software development, and actually building products uh, for various companies, and then managing regulatory compliance functions uh, globally for for a lot of different companies. And in my work recently with Xavier Health um, uh, in their their AI initiative, uh, we've been which for those of you that are not familiar with it is a sort of this combination of industry, academia, and and FDA to try to help industry understand how to build frameworks to, to comply with applicable regulations uh, and, and guidance in this area, and then work with FDA to determine how, how they regulate it, how they build regulatory structures around it. And um, I remember earlier in session one, um, uh, it was uh, uh, one of the speakers, I think it was Ms. Osorio, noted that there's not much out there in terms of a regulatory framework and regulatory literature for AI systems. Uh, and Khadija mentioned uh, the uh, 
uh, the the work that the FDA has put out there, the, the uh, discussion papers on what they propose might be a potential regulatory framework. But as of right now, these are all this is all just thinking. Uh, in, in the research that I did and and in, in building some tools that companies can use around using existing regulatory frameworks to move AI systems forward, uh, we found found one country that actually has published guidance that's enforceable. Uh, around AI systems for medical devices, and of, of all places, it's Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, no other country on planet Earth actually has uh, enforceable regulatory frameworks around for, for AI systems. Um, and, and, and actually, I appreciate Khadija's comment. I, I keep going back to her, but just I, I'm so interested in the things she had to say. But I appreciate her comments about the use of the pre-cert program as well. Uh, and, and what a novel use that is. I, I was involved in the capability maturity model from Carnegie Mellon way back in the in the early 90s. And uh, to see how that's now been adopted by the FDA, when some of us tried to do that back in the mid 90s to get them to look at that, they were not interested at all. And it's nice to see how that shift has now occurred where they're using that program and modifying it for use and now really focused on process maturity and, and, and to apply it in this context, I think is really, really a great idea. Um, one of the things I wanted to cover real quickly in, in, in my comments is, is something that Christina asked me to focus on related to our work in a specific working team within the AI committee at Xavier, which is the Good Machine Learning Practices team. Uh, the FDA asked this team to focus on bias. And one of the things that we did was to uh, put together a, a, a white paper to help medical device manufacturers uh, identify, evaluate, and mitigate bias and, and, and to create a feedback loop where that continued to mature uh, as they had post-market data available. So in the in the paper that we developed that is that is now I think on the hairy edge of being published we we, we are um, we may have an issue with a publish getting a, a publisher but the the, the paper is pretty pretty close um, it is is has two elements to it the, the first is obviously identifying types of bias and there's a, there's a whole table that we've pulled from a variety of sources that lays out different types of biases and and what that means but then the core of the paper is to uh, establish a framework for identifying, mitigating, and, and uh, identifying, assessing, and mitigating, and controlling bias over time. And what we, ch what we chose to use was a medical device risk management standard called ISO 14971. And this, medic and this standard uh, follows a, a process that's full life cycle. Um, in other words, you know, thinking in design controls terms, from uh, the establishment of initial user needs all the way through design inputs, outputs, uh, design verification, design validation, design validation transfer, and then post-market. This would be built early and then modified throughout the life cycle and then continually modified throughout the product lifespan. Uh, but in this model, you analyze the risk, evaluate whether or not that risk is acceptable from a safety risk management point of view, uh, control it, evaluate whether the overall residual risk of the device is acceptable, uh, and then put a review in place of that to establish things like a risk benefit analysis uh, to establish that the benefits outweigh the risks. And finally, from a post-production standpoint, provide that feedback loop to see if your predicted values, your predicted risks, um, probabilities and severities of those risks are accurate, and if not, make adjustments, and if necessary, adjust the risk control measures. So what we did with that in the, a, in the bias uh, space was to create a framework where instead of thinking about impact to patient safety, we're thinking about impact to intended use of the device and, um, and how bias might impact that. So first, in the terms of analyzing the, the, the bias uh, that, it's, that you've identified is to break the bias into a source type sequence combination. What's the source of the bias? What type of bias is it? And what's the sequence of events that, that presents that bias in the, in the everyday use of the device? And then determine if that bias is positive or negative. Uh, some bias we want intentionally introduced into a, a medical device to achieve a certain outcome. Uh, from that, if we find a, a negative bias, that's where the, the model takes off, right? We're looking at likelihood of occurrence, likelihood of, of impact um, on the intended use uh, and the degree of that impact. And then, a, and then a flag to determine if that bias is safety related so that the bias impact assessment connects to safety risk analysis as well. Um, uh, from that, evaluate whether that, that source type sequence combination is acceptable. Uh, we, we provide some quantitative and qualitative and narrative ways of doing that depending on the maturity of the, uh, the, uh, the medical device company. And then, uh, 
look at ways to mitigate the bias by determining what those mitigations are, implementing them, verifying that those implementations were effective, looking at residually, did you actually alleviate or mitigate the bias uh, to where you brought it to an acceptable level? Uh, and, then, and then finally, in terms of the development life cycle before you transfer it out, is to evaluate again that overall bias to the intended use of the system. Is it acceptable at a product level, not just an individual sequence level? Um, we articulate that in some uh, benefit versus bias statement um, and then disclose, uh, you know, obviously in, in, in using some critical thinking here, but disclose um, uh, residual bias. Right uh, to potential users of the system, where we've been able not been able to fully mitigate it, but they understand where we feel like we've noticed it. And then finally, there uh, from a post market standpoint, is to use post market data to, to provide a feedback loop to see if your estimations and the work that you did initially is actually accurate and effective. Um, and then to go back and collect, review, update that bias assessment, determine if there are new design uh, changes that need to occur within the algorithm or the device uh, at large to be able to address that. So super high speed review of that paper, but um, hopefully helpful in, in uh, um, helping people understand from a, from a regulatory point of view, from a medical device manufacturer point of view, how do you build that into the design controls that are required uh, by the FDA um, on, ongoing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christina to get into our Q&A session. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so what a great, I, I've been frantically taking notes during all of these presentations. Um, and and I, I think I wanna pick up on, on where Eric left off, which is really, where are there policies that could be put into place by, uh, by the agency, um, by FDA and, and other agencies that may have authority over, over algorithms such as FCC, um, or third-party evaluators might put into place as, the, as, as they are taking over the role of, of looking at algorithms that aren't under uh, uh, other authorities. Um, how can they think about what policies to put in place to detect and, 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 and um, uh, prevent and, or mitigate bias? Let me, let, to detect bias, but, then all, but, but in, in sort of an overall way, I, I'm, I'm reframing this question as I go. <laughs> Um, I think that, you know, we heard from a variety of speakers that really talked about the idea that you can test for bias at the end, and Zia talked about, about that after the algorithm's already done, but there are things that you can do along the way to understand if there's higher risk of a biased algorithm. And I guess I would be interested in understanding um, a little bit more about, hey, what's more important, that final test um, or, or, or the process, or are they both equally important? And um, I might start with uh, Khadija. Great, yeah, um, you know, and to address this question, I'm actually gonna reference one of the early earlier speakers, Kasia, and what I really liked about um, Kasia's comments was that they mentioned this idea um, of AI as a socio-technical system, right? And if, and what that means if we think about, because, you know, it's it's a great delight to me as a social scientist that this idea of AI as a, as a socio-technical system is gaining traction. So um, when I started having these conversations about AI and bi bias and uh, healthcare and doing my postdoc project in 2016, right? Um, I you know didn't hear much in in those discussions of the, this use of you know in the clinical setting thinking about AIs as socio-technical systems, right? But this is a term now that I said is gaining traction and people are understanding this, right? But often, or one way to think about this concept of AI as a, as a socio-technical system is to say, well, there are sort of humans involved in the process, which is true, right? But I think another way, and this is getting back to Cassia's comments from earlier today, is that if we really think of AI as a socio-technical technical system, we move away from thinking of just the thing, just the device, and really think about the thing as a set of different uh, as a set of multiple technologies with multiple people and stakeholders involved. And so if we think about AI in that sort of expanded way as a socio-technical system rather than a specific targeted uh, device, then how can we think about, think about regulating it, right? And I think instead of actually, uh, you know, getting us into a situation where we say, well, how can we regulate a socio-technical system, right? We can't actually do that. I think it actually opens up some really interesting ways to approach the, the 
the, the issue of sort of regulating a, a you know, device like AI and the, the sort of AIs that we see being used today in health. And part of, and what I think is so interesting about the FDA is that through, and this is my interpretation of this pre cert program is that it is an attempt to begin to regulate AI as kind of a socio-technical system, right? Because this pre-cert program, as I said, is not, and it's not enforceable, you know, just like was, you know, mentioned, this is kind of a pilot program. It's not um, fully sort of recognized yet, but this pre-cert program by shifting the focus onto the company, right? You're not just looking at how do we regulate this particular device and its inputs and its outputs, and if those inputs are biased or not, but let's include more, uh, sort of entities and stakeholders and agents into this regulatory frame. So there's the device itself, there's also the company, who else might be included? And how can we think about regulating this system, this socio-technical system, rather than uh, uh, regulating just a particular technology, like I said, with particular inputs and outputs. And so that's where I think we can see some really exciting opportunities for regulation by not just the FDA, but as you mentioned, by um, uh, third parties or you know um, other agencies, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I want to add to Khadija's remark here and kind of fall back on just the regulatory language that, that sort of is my comfort zone. But two things I see might be helpful from a policy standpoint. Um, well, well, three. First of all, I think whether it's the Xavier paper or something similar, the FDA needs to build guidance, a framework of guidance to medical device manufacturers that helps them walk through that sort of risk management type of model uh, in identifying and mitigating bias. Uh, secondly, I think as you would with, with safety risk management, these bias tools need to be used, and Gigi mentioned this earlier, um, throughout the entire product life cycle, right? From the very beginning of establishing the intended use and the user needs for the device. And third, um, similar to the way that ISO 14971 in 2019 um, changed the definition of harm for the purposes of risk management, I think that we should we should adopt a very similar approach in terms of bias. What 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 ISO, what the ISO standard did in 2019 was it took the word physical out of the definition of harm, uh, where where previously the definition of harm was around physical injury to people, property, the environment. It is that word physical is no longer there, and they specifically speak to uh, data privacy and other kinds of data needs as an impetus for that change in definition. And I think making that change in terms of the way we mitigate bias and viewing that as it relates to, to risk and to safety risk without that def, without that word physical, I think might be helpful as well. Interesting. And I think, Gigi, um, I was actually about to throw to you because- uh, you I, know, I was just I, thinking, <laughs> but just, it's like flashback of a debate I had yesterday <laughs> with a coworker. Um, before I answer the question, right, let's establish the fact that the development of AI ML is an iterative process. Right, we have to explore, we have to be creative, we have to tinker. So with that in mind, I think what we want to keep in mind of, you know, we don't do any clinical studies without actually first writing down a protocol, right? The, the, the issue of, you know, the problem we're trying to solve, the overall intent, I think that by no, by no means should be established in the very beginning. But I, I will be worried about trying to track and required reporting throughout the product development lifecycle because of the iterative nature and creative nature of the work. Um, but there are specific points before the model is impacting an individual or is being used to draw a conclusion where we have to be disciplined around. That, that's my personal view. Mm -hmm. What about some of the, you know, so you talked about some of the automated tests and other tests that you think about when you're looking at your data and starting to build the algorithm. Are those types of things that, that, that would make sense to submit to a, that you, that you did those, those types of tests and the results of them that would make sense to submit to a regulatory authority, um, similar to, to some of the preclinical studies that might be done on, on a more traditional medical device? Um, I think the aspects of it, typically, I think what we need is to come to agreement on what are the metrics we want to track. Absolutely. <laughs> There's so much misunderstanding. Like, just had some great interviews with new data science candidates. And, and the moment you brought up the word bias and tracking bias, that's a million different definitions. If we as a community can determine the top few, then I think you'll make a lot of sense. Otherwise, um, you'll be very muddy water. Yeah. Can I make a case for um, th th there's one 
I think really, really important thread that's run through a bunch of these comments, which is like, what exactly are we regulating? And I think that was also one of the comments in the Q&A as well, like what's good enough for performance? And so I think that there are like a, a couple of different, what I'd call targets for regulation. One target is the company. And I think I completely agree with everything that um, Khadija, you, you said about like, it, it's really excellent that we are starting to think about the culture at the company. That said, of course, that I actually don't think we should rely on that. And I don't think that should be the only target for regulation because it, it would be a little bit like saying um, in drugs, well, you know, Merck, it's a good company, very good culture. They were, you know, let's just approve their drugs. Right. Even, and who, but, who, so, is, that, who is defining what's good culture? Just yeah. wanted to add that there as well. Oh, right? that, exactly. It, it's a very nebulous definition. The second one is I think Gigi, you know, I, I've, I've actually um, really been impressed with a lot of the work that IBM Watson has done around this automated check pipeline. Um, and I think that, you know, if an algorithm fails those automated checks, it's clearly a non-starter. It needs to be performing well in different groups. And I think that there are, you know, just significance testing is a, is a very good place to start for defining what's different in different groups. But again, that wouldn't have caught this bias that we found in our work, because recall that the algorithm was predicting cost for lots mm -hmm. of different people. And it was actually doing so very, very well. And in a completely unbiased way, the problem was that cost was the wrong thing to predict. And that's what induced the bias that we found. So I think that even though we are, you know, it's constantly evolving, like there are many different ways to use inputs and to structure models, and that's all in flux. There's one thing that's stable, and that is what I should, what I think is the right target for regulation, which is what is the purpose of the algorithm? What is it used for? The algorithm can change. Lots of things can change. That's okay. The black box can stay closed. Ultimately, the algorithm is used for a purpose. And if that algorithm is predicting in a way that produces distortions in that decision over and above what the algorithm is supposed to be doing, that is bias. And that has a very clear parallel to civil rights law. I don't think we need new laws to kind of like enforce this. And in my work with state mm. attorneys general, that set of laws has proven very adequate for addressing this, this particular problem. So I think that like, you know, investigations are an important part of that. Prospective guidance to industry about what bias is and, and what that looks like is also really important because it's better to prevent it than to prosecute it later. But I think that's the thing we should be regulating is the use case and the purpose of the algorithm and whether the algorithm is distorting important decisions. That's ultimately what we care about here. So yeah, I'll make a quick comment. I see Sarah's got a, got her unmute, unmuted um, as well. But just really quickly, I, I really like what you what you have to say, and I think it's one of the reasons why when we wrote this paper within Xavier Health, the 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 real uh, uh, the thing we clarified here was that when we're assessing bias, we're assessing that sequence that 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 source type and sequence combination against the intended use of the device, which has to be established. For all devices, when you do a product submission and establish design inputs as part of design control. So it's absolutely the right place to start. I cannot agree with more, right? Intent. It's all about the intent. That's what we can, that's what we should know from the very beginning in a protocol. And that's what we should be tracking. And, and what's good enough, right? Depends on the use case. It's going to be, I don't think it's tractable <laughs> if you're looking for specific measures to track. So. Sarah, did you want to chime in? I was just going to say beyond the like specific metrics that we're tracking, I, I actually, I really like the European guidelines for trustworthy AI that were released, I think in 2019, because I think that like, you have to take that step back and like, think about these algorithms at a higher level. Like, is there human agency and oversight of these models? Like, are they really transparent? And like the way the FDA like has all these like flow charts and guidelines around like what transparent means and like showing performance characteristics of a model to like a physician who's trained in biostatistics is very different than showing the same data to someone who is, you know, has an associate's degree and is working the front desk of a clinic. And so I feel like these, like there's right now in these regulatory like frameworks, there's so much detail kind of a nuance wrapped up in them. It's hard. And like, I almost, I feel like we need to step back and think about like where are models most dangerous? And in my opinion, like we need to, there are these models that are being baked into the electronic health records that are already owned by, by um, like many, many health systems. Are, have a lot of potential for harm because they can get turned on by, you know, clinical systems teams, you know, people who are, who are just um, 
you know, their job is really just to maintain and build the EHR and there, there's no, there's no like steps between that. And so I feel like a lot of, one of the things that the FDA needs to work on incorporating into this approach is like, where are the, the models really like in impacting massive patient populations and being turned on like without stop gaps. And so it's very different even at UCSF, like how easy a model can be turned on if it's already like an Epic model compared to a model that we go and collaborate with industry on. And those are like similar companies potentially, but the, the, the mechanism for that model getting into production or really impacting patients is very different. It's much shorter and easier if it's already baked into the EHR. And so I think we have to like think about that as well as, as a um, area that really, really needs regulation. Yeah, um, uh, I wanted to uh, jump in and, and uh, apologies earlier for jumping in, Ziad, but I was just so enthusiastic about this point that you were making about, uh, you know, that the, for the targets of policy and what we should think about as targets of the policy, be, and it sort of relates to the point that Sarah was making about, in, in some ways, the draft guidance that we have from the FDA has a lot of detail and nuance and flowcharts, but in other ways, it's very vague. So even this idea of uh, from this pre-cert program, which is you know, again, sort of shifting the regulation, shifting part of the regulatory lens to the companies, it's this culture of quality and excellence, right? But what does that mean? What does that mean exactly? Who gets to decide what a culture of quality and excellence is, right? Going back to Gigi's point of like, you know, IBM, it sounds like you are actually really doing some good work within your company to develop the, that culture of quality and excellence, especially around bias. Um, but maybe that is specific to IBM. Can it scale? Um, could it be something that's reproducible across different companies? If so, you know, how would the FDA go about sort of regulating uh, IBM's culture of quality and excellence versus, you know, another company's, right? So I think there is this kind of there and, and as Eric was mentioning earlier, right, these, uh, this, this policy, it, it's still really like in development, right? So I think it does pro uh, provide an opportunity because these policies are in development for um, all of us as a community who's concerned about these issues to, you know, ask for more nuance and suggest, you know, uh, uh, some specifics where we think they're needed. And again, just going back to Sarah's um, point about UCSF and, you know, this huge hospital system and the, the kinds of models that you're using, um, you know, in, in my understanding of the regulatory domain as it stands right now, if these models were developed, you know, at UCSF and just used within UCSF, they're not even under FDA's you know, regulatory purview, right? So, but does, of course, that doesn't mean that they should not be evaluated and and um, reviewed and things like that, right? But I think it also points back to this regulatory gap. And I think it's also really important to think about the sort of um, context in which all of these uh, part of the larger context when thinking about clinical decision support tools, for example, right? And there was some, you know, kind of back and forth and a little bit of controversy when the FDI, FDA was putting out some of, as it was sort of um, putting out some draft guidance and ideas about how to regulate some of these tools, the CDS in industry sort of pushed back and said, this is too much regulation, right? And pushed for some devices not to be, um, you know, in the FDA's purview. So we have to, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, that this is, this policy is happening within the context of a kind of competitive market where there are people who um, have influence and kind of maybe more influence than others, right? So all of us, we are maybe really interested in sort of making sure that, uh, you know, bias is mitigated, but I think it would be naive if we didn't also recognize that there are also other influences and other actors out there for whom, you know, could sort of shift um, the development of policies in ways if they don't, um, uh, if they're not sort of aligned with their interests, uh, for example. So I think it's important uh, to keep that in mind as, as well. And one last point to make, just going back to Gigi's point about, um, you know, not having the data available to do the kinds of bias testing that, you know, you'd want to do in your companies. I was just in an, another panel presentation yesterday with government um, 
people from other government agencies, statistical um, uh, agencies in, in government who say, you know, we want to get access to EHR data, but we can't because they're from private companies and, you know, they'll let us get some EH, EHR data sometimes, but not often, right? So I think it's really interesting to see, uh, again, if we sort of think at a wider lens in terms of regulating, like what other kinds of policy uh, development that we're seeing happening in other spaces, how might that connect to, you know, this very particular domain of AI and health, right? How can other activities around getting some of that data from private, out, you know, uh, from private companies into uh, more sort of the public domain, how that might help in this particular um, case? I actually want to draw on that and an audience question, which mentions that, and, and I think that this is the point I made in my introduction, uh, a presentation as, uh, as well earlier today about that, that you can have a biased algorithm, it's not a machine learning algorithm. And so that final test um, and clinical uh, testing of, of these algorithms is really essential. And would love to talk a little, hear a little bit about how what, um, you know, what some of the guidance around software before uh, machine learning really hit, 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 uh, hit the ground running um, has to say about how to think about testing for bias and in, 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 in both software and in more traditional clinical devices. Um, so we'd love to, to start with Eric, but I see that Ziad's got his, his I'm muted as well. So I'm gonna go to you right afterwards, Ziad. Eric? Yeah, so if I think about the, the existing guidance around, around software development, how it, how it speaks to bias, I, 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 I don't, I think you're really looking at something like the a risk management framework, right? Um, and that's really where, so you'd have to think of bias in terms of harm uh, using an, the existing guidances that are out there. So using the ISO 14971 standard, um, FDA for, for all of its work, you know, thinking around risk and its, and its application of risk management really doesn't have a lot of original literature on this. It really looks to the ISO standards. Um, but from that standpoint, I think the use of those standards, the adjustment of the definition of harm away from purely physical, although that's certainly included um, uh, in a big way in thinking about bias, um, I think that's a one way to use existing framework. In terms of software as a medical device, you know, I, I think um, most algorithm development occurs during the uh, um, uh, really very early on from the establishment of intended uses and, and user needs and, and design inputs. And I think from that standpoint, we're establishing that initial framework. Uh, and if we look at one of the IEC standards uh, for software development, 62304, which lays out sort of three tiers of design, uh, software requirements, software architecture, and detailed design, I think one way to use that, you can use that, that standard, I think, as a way to build in the, the, um, the, the requirements around what bias is acceptable and unacceptable. Um, at the software requirements level, and then architecturally, uh, where the software item includes the algorithms, uh, use that in the way it interfaces to the rest of the system as part of the integration and unit testing that you do at a lower level. Uh, so I think all the pieces are there. It's just that nobody points to it and says, you know, algorithm development goes here, um, you know, uh, bias testing goes here. Uh, but the buckets have been there, I think, all along, and, and I don't think we're talking about changing the software development life cycle for the purposes of alleviating bias. Yeah. I, I really, I really like that um, expanded definition of harm, Eric. I, I think that's that's really perfect because I think that it what it illustrates is that the thing we care about is an algorithm having a bad impact on some population and it doesn't have to be physical. It can be kind of like losing out on a chance for extra help. It can be not um, being offered a kidney transplant. And I think that you know everyone's intuitions about algorithmic bias very understandably come from our intuitions about human bias. And when we think about human bias, it's like, oh, okay, well, I see that someone is not white, for example, and I treat them differently. The analogy to algorithmic bias actually doesn't work at all. Like everyone assumes that like, oh, if the algorithm knows that if that someone is black or white, then it's gonna treat them differently. But to the algorithm, black or white is just like X42 and X43. <laughs> and you know, like the, the reason, for example, we care about so, so much about the kidney adjustment for race, it's not because it's race in particular, it's because it leads to black patients being offered fewer kidney transplants and, and being losing out on care. That's the problem. There are many other race adjustments in, in medical um, risk scores that adjust up black patients. 
that they get black patients more access to treatment. So the thing that we care about is access to treatments or you know, extra care or some scarce resource that's being allocated. So it's the harm that we care about. And you know, conveniently, the harm is something that we can measure, we can statistically test. So, you know, like we care about the output of the algorithm, not the inputs to the algorithm at the end of the day. And the good news is that it's much, much easier to regulate the outputs of the algorithm than to regulate this constantly evolving, you know, 5,000 variable model that's changing over, like we don't need to deal with that. We can just look at one variable, which is the score that the algorithm produces and determine if that's causing harm and, and deal with that. So I think it's, it's just, I, I love your really anchoring it around harm, Eric. I think that seems like exactly the right way to go. Um, and I, we only have one minute left, but I do have a quick question. I'm just gonna throw it right to Sarah, which you talked about the fact that once you release an algorithm, then it's, then it's out there and people can do what they want with the prediction. Um, and, and so who, who is the authority over that? How do we make sure that people are using algorithms in the right way? Uh, you know, FDA does not regulate the, the practice of medicine, although of course they, they are interested in making sure that medical devices are designed in such a way that they're used correctly. But, but who, does have, uh, who does have authority to, to make sure that people are using algorithms correctly um, and, and, and mitigate it if it's not, if they're not? I mean, right now it's the health systems, right? So, but I, I, this is why this is problematic because you know, UCSF is resourced to do this and there are so many like small community hospitals that don't have data science teams who can think about, or even like biostatisticians who can think about it in this way. I think what we need to do is like, as health systems and as you know, leaders in medicine come together and like, ask, you know, we need to work with the companies who are designing these algorithms, especially these, you know, EHR based ones that are just getting used without evaluation and really like help them understand how they need to be building the algorithms and, you know, in, in designing outcomes in a way that we really can make sure people are acting on them in meaningful and beneficial ways as opposed to things that are harmful to our patients. Well, I just want to thank the entire panel. I think this has been a great discussion. Clearly did not need me. <laughs> um, and, and so thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your thoughts and insights. I, like I said, I, I think that this has been a great session. I really pulled out a lot of, a lot of uh, great key takeaways away from it. Um, we are going to go to break now. We will be coming back at 2.10. So a much shorter break this time. And I will see you all then. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to today's, um, uh, the next session uh, in today's event. So um, my name is Andrea Toomey, and I'm the Health Equity Policy Fellow at Duke Margolis, and I'll be moderating uh, this next session on utilizing AI to reduce bias and injustice in healthcare. So as we've heard in sessions one and two, there are some emerging best practices to prevent mitigate and detect biases in AI products for healthcare settings. We've also spoken about how healthcare and AI are built on a system of injustice due to systemic racism, discrimination, and patterns of social inequality. Now we'll be discussing whether and how AI can improve access to care and mitigate um, these already prevalent injustices and human biases in healthcare and uh, in the US and globally. We're joined by an esteemed set of presenters and panelists today who will uh, be discussing examples from a justice and health equity lens. Our presenters include Art Papier, who's the founder of uh, Visual DX, who will be presenting on his innovative work of Visual DX, as well as related examples to showcase how AI enabled technology can help address current gaps in medical training that lead to disparate uh, health outcomes, as well as how AI tools can help alleviate other existing biases or inequities in healthcare. Uh, we'll then hear from Emma Pearson, who's an assistant professor of computer science at Cornell University. She'll be discussing examples of using algorithms to detect and mitigate human biases, including examples from her, um, from her work on measuring knee pain via x-ray images. And our last presenter is uh, Mercy Asiedu. She's co-founder of Global AI Powered Health Technologies, uh, otherwise known as GAP Health. And Mercy is going to be presenting her work of GAP, GAP Health, as well as her previous work on creating diverse imaging data sets to help automate cervical cancer screenings. Mercy is currently a Schmidt Science Postdoctoral Research Fellow at MIT um, at the Jamil Clinic for AI and Healthcare. And following these presentations, we'll have some fantastic additional pa panelists to kick off our discussion and share additional remarks. Uh, Jaina Scheich Borg is an associate research professor at Duke University and co director of both Duke's Moral Artificial Intelligence Lab and Duke's Moral Attitudes and Decision Making Lab. And lastly, but not least, uh, Sonu Tadani Israni is executive director of Presence, a center at Stanford Medicine and the program in bedside medicine also at Stanford University. So now I'll hand it over to Art. Art? Thank you so much. It's my screen show. Yes. Andrea, thanks so much for the warm welcome and to Christina for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to participate in the meeting. I'm gonna um, weave in a talk also about clinical decision support and frame the relationship between machine learning and AI and in the broader field of clinical decision support. So our group is thinking about a very large problem. The problem we're thinking about is diagnostic errors. And this is an infographic using an iceberg uh, to talk about hospital quality and safety. Many are familiar with the IOM report to Air is Human in 1999. There was a 2015 report on diagnostic errors in medicine. And from that report, uh, we created this infographic, 74,000 deaths a year uh, from diagnostic errors. And probably a lot larger now with the pandemic going on and clinical care so challenging in, in our hospitals and clinics. Now, I'm a dermatologist. So when we think about diagnostic error, uh, we see it every day. And, and the reason is, is that uh, diagnosing clues from the skin is really not just a domain of dermatologists. Uh, primary care physicians, ER physicians see clues on the skin every day and often they miss it. So this infographic saying that in America, 65% of skin presentations are not seen by dermatologists. In the UK, it's probably closer to 95% of skin presentations are seen by GPs or other uh, clinicians. And yet uh, GPs have been shown to be about 50% accurate in diagnosis from the skin. So, you know, solutions have evolved like telemedicine, teledermatology, and of course now we're all thinking about the role of AI and machine learning. So this is a picture of 
of two pictures of the same diagnosis, acute meningococcemia. So for the non-clinicians on the phone, this is a life-threatening illness, probably in 24 to 48 hours without uh, treatment, the patient dies. And you can see that the sign of uh, what we call purpura, which is bleeding into the skin, leakage of blood from blood vessels, that purple color is purple on the right, but you see on the left that purple on brown is not purple. So there's a real challenge in recognizing skin clues for the non-dermatologist, but even greater challenge if you're trying to diagnose on brown skin, if all you've done is train on light skin. So back in 2006, we published a paper in the journal of the American Academy of Dermatology called Disparities in Dermatologic Educational Resources. And I had a medical student count every picture in all the leading textbooks to see what was the distribution of imagery to teach dermatology in brown skin. And we showed 15 years ago that it was quite biased, that educational resources were really skewed towards light skin. And so tying us now into this field of decision support, the idea is really augmented intelligence. And so when, when I think when people talk about AI machine learning, some people are working on diagnostic machine learning, meaning that your promise is that you take the picture and the picture tells you it's melanoma or it's a benign lesion and it does it with a certain accuracy rate and you're saying, for instance, that my machine learning model is more accurate than dermatologists. You're making that claim. That's diagnostic machine learning. Our group is really thinking about non-diagnostic machine learning and augmented intelligence. So this equation is basically the equation of clinical decision support borrowed by a researcher, a great guy, Chuck Friedman, who created this years ago in the field of medical informatics, which basically saying the brain plus the computer is more powerful than the brain alone. And so this can include machine learning, AI, and rule-based systems, Bayesian systems. It's basically saying it's not man versus machine, the machine smarter than the, the human. It's saying that doctors that use technology, use augmented intelligence, are gonna be more powerful than the doctors that don't. And so we're living through this historic transition in society, and in particular in medicine, going from a memory-oriented paradigm where you, know, you go to med school, you do your residency, you try to put it all in your brain, and then as a generalist, one patient comes in with chest pain, the next patient comes in with headache, the next patient comes in with abdominal pain, next patient with a rash, and the patient has the expectation that that ER physician seeing a different patient every 20 minutes is gonna be nailing it and getting incredible accuracy. Well, it was always a myth that a human could memorize it all and ask the right questions. And that's why for 40 or 50 years, people have been trying to develop clinical decision support to augment decisions. So we're moving from this training paradigm of memorize it all to be more process oriented and assisted decisions. And when I was in med school, there are no computers. Now we have these supercomputers that are in our pockets. You know, the smartphone is a supercomputer compared to what we had even 20 years ago. And so you have now students and residents that we're encouraging them to look up information. And that's a sea change. And we're doing this transition fitfully. So not every teacher, not every uh, professor in the medical school is teaching a resident to look things up. And certainly many are unaware of what AI and machine learning can do. So we have a very uneven landscape in terms of how we're transitioning medicine to using augmented intelligence. So this is a, a huge societal change. And medicine is the last profession really to take advantage of computing. Architects were designing on computers 30 years ago. So in terms of machine learning, we've been ingesting images and building models on, for machine learning that combine with our clinical decision support system, Visual DX. And so we've been gathering images for 20 years, actually over 20 years, probably about 30 years. We started 
by scanning Kodachromes and film-based images to digital. And we've been tagging those images with labels that are not just diagnosis, but the type of lesion that's in the picture, you know, a blister versus an ulcer. And we've been making sure that the collection is equitable from the start. So we have uh, hundreds of thousands of pictures and over 30% of the images are in skin of color. And so this image here is a composite of the same disease lupus. And you can see the variation that's present in different skin tones. So in medicine, you have many, many different presentations of the same disease. And you have a problem where there's a lot of diagnostic error because of variation. And there's a lot of diagnostic error because of bias. And the bias is not only racial bias, it could be gender bias. For example, you know, it's assumed that a woman with chest pain, doctors diagnose myocardial infarctions less frequently in women as bias there. So there's all forms of cognitive bias that we've been interested in and trying to figure out how do we reduce cognitive bias at the time of decision-making. So we've ingested all these images with tags, we've created machine learning models, and we have a product that's been out there for 20 years, but only in the last few has machine learning been part of the clinical decision support system. So this is a real case. This was a case of a patient that came into an emergency room in Baltimore and Dr. Brown, an emergency physician, took this picture. And then the second panel on the left, the bottom three icons describe the skin exam features. And this is a really important part, part of the story in that Dr. Brown said to me, all right, that's the language of dermatology. I'm an ER doctor practicing 30 years. I accepted the lesion as being the correct match because of the icon, and I learned the language of dermatology at the same time. So our take on AI and machine learning is that it should guide and teach, and it should be part of a highly reliable system. So Dr. Brown is entering, it's on the finger, and he's entering other factors, and those factors are tied to a knowledge base tied to the literature. So we're not total believers in that AI and machine learning is gonna solve medicine's problems. In fact, we don't believe that. We believe that there's a role for very specific models that need to be equitable and it gets tied to decision support rules. And so quickly, uh, because we have limited time, we've been collecting these images, we're making sure it's equitable. And we've learned from our users that the images are important for patient education. So it's not just AI machine learning, we have a long ways to go in how we teach and educate our patients. And that imagery needs to be equitable. We get this incredible feedback from clinicians that say, you know, I shared an image of what shingles look like with my patient. And I was able to show them how it looks in their skin tone and how meaningful it was for their patient. And then we took the clinical decision support system and we made sure that the icons to represent the lesions on brown skin for teaching were equally matched to light skin. And we've heard, we've heard these incredible stories in the last year and a half. We've been doing this for 20 years, but in the last year and a half with the attention on racism, you know, I had a wonderful conversation with a colleague who's an African-American dermatologist. And she said to me, Art, there's so much interest in skin of color atlases but I'm African-American and I see white patients, I don't need just a skin of color atlas. I need tools that are gonna help me every day with all different skin types. So that's a really important point that we shouldn't just isolate our thinking to improving decisions in one group. Let's try to improve decisions for everybody. Dr. Elbuluk is a wonderful dermatologist who pushed me a year and a half ago to start something called Project Impact. So Dr. Elbulik saw Visual DX and said, we need to go further. And when we're working with the Skin of Color Society and the New England Journal of Medicine Group and other collaborators, uh, even around the world, to really work on re reducing disparities in medicine and highlighting tools. 
It's at projectimpact.org. It's a great resource for anyone's interested in racial bias in the skin. And we're making progress. We have over 60% of US medical schools teaching with Visual DX. We have major medical systems that have been using it for years, like the entire VA medical system has been using Visual DX for a decade, the Mayo Clinic and others, and then around the world. And so we really look forward to collaboration out of this meeting. Anyone that's interested in improving diagnosis, um, we'd really like to have a conversation. Thanks so much for your time. Great, thank you, Art, for that presentation on the use case of equitable imagery. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Emma Pearson on using AI to understand and reduce inequality and pain. Emma? Thanks so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you great. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Cornell Tech and then also at uh, Weill Cornell Medical School. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'm going to be talking um, about a promising approach to using AI to understand and reduce inequality and pain on the broader theme of sort of how we can use AI not just to increase, but also to reduce inequality. Um, and this is joint work with David Cutler, Yuri Leskovic, Senel Melanathan, and Ziad Obermeyer, and it appears a couple months ago in Nature Medicine. Next slide, please. So a general fact about pain is that disadvantaged groups experience more of it. You see this for socioeconomically disadvantaged groups across a variety of you know, types of pain, multiple continents, multiple communities, samples, et cetera, and you see it for racially disadvantaged groups as well. Next slide, please. And this is also true in knee osteoarthritis, which is one of the most common causes of disabling pain in older adults. You know, many people listening to this talk will develop it if they haven't done so already. Um, and in this condition, as in other conditions, disadvantaged groups experience greater pain. Here's the interesting thing. They have greater pain even when we control for how severe the doctor thinks their knee osteoarthritis is, as measured by looking at an x-ray of the knee. So let me explain that to you a bit more. Next slide. So how do we measure severity in osteoarthritis? Basically, a radiologist uh, looks at an x-ray of the patient's knee uh, and then assesses it on a bunch of clinical features um, and gives it a single summary measure, referred to as kelgren lorentz grade. Next slide. The problem with the severity score is that it was developed literally decades ago in heavily white British populations. And so it's possible that it might not capture all the environmental and occupational factors that are relevant to pain in modern and more diverse populations who live and work very differently. It might be missing important knee features. Next slide. So we're going to seek to use machine learning to assess whether there are overlooked physical features in the knee which would help explain the higher pain levels in disadvantaged groups. Next slide. Specifically, we're going to train a deep learning algorithm, a convolutional neural network, because those are sort of achieved state of the art in medical imaging tasks of length. Um, and we're going to train it to search for additional signal in the knee x-ray that the doctor might be missing, which would explain the higher pain levels in disadvantaged groups. So how are we actually going to set up this training? You know, how are we actually going to train the model? The standard approach to training medical models is to train a model to replicate the doctor's judgment. Uh, so here, that would mean train the model to predict the doctor's severity score. But that's actually exactly what we don't want to do here because our whole hypothesis is that that severity score might be biased or incomplete. Next slide. Uh, so yeah, that basically, you know, if the doctor judgment doesn't capture all the pain relevant features, we don't want to train a model just to replicate it. Next slide. Instead, we're going to train the model to learn from the patient by predicting the patient's pain. So rather than just listening to the doctor and trying to replicate this potentially biased or incomplete clinical knowledge, we're going to try to learn from the patient directly by predicting the patient's self-reported pain. Next slide. So to be very concrete, the input to the model is an x-ray of the knee and the output is a knee-specific pain prediction. Next slide. And if controlling for that algorithmic severity score, the model's prediction of pain, narrows racial and socioeconomic pain disparities more than controlling for the clinician's severity score, it implies that the clinician is overlooking knee features, which could help explain disadvantaged patients' higher pain levels. Next slide. And that is, in fact, exactly what we see. We find that the algorithm is able to narrow racial and socioeconomic uh, disparities in pain. 
Specifically, controlling for the algorithm severity score, as opposed to the clinician, narrows the unexplained racial and socioeconomic pain gap by more than two to five uh, times more than when you control for the clinician's severity measures. The algorithm is able to sort of find physical knee features which help narrow that gap in pain. It's also able to predict pain better overall. Next slide. We also find a couple other interesting results. Um, the, the first result, and you know, this is very related to what Harvey was just telling us, is that you know, data set diversity is very important. We do an experiment where we try training the model on a non-diverse train set, sort of with a lack of racial diversity, and we find that the model trained on the diverse train set does better. And this sort of really speaks to the importance of diversity in medical data sets. We also uh, do a simulation, which implies that our algorithm could potentially reduce disparities in access to surgery. Because the algorithm is likely to uh, assign uh, disadvantaged patients higher severity scores, and those severity scores influence the allocation of surgery, the algorithm is also, in turn, more likely to allocate them surgery. So one exciting direction for future work is, could we build sort of a clinical decision aid on top of this algorithm, which helps clinicians identify knee features that they might otherwise have missed, and you know, maybe, maybe take a second look at those patients. Next slide. So, I want to close by speaking for a couple of minutes about the broader implications of this work. Um, this work points to the potential of machine learning to reduce inequality in healthcare. It's intrinsically a machine learning pro a project, right? Like convolutional neural networks have supercharged our ability to find signal in medical images. And that's a technology that we didn't have until about 10 years ago. So machine learning gives us an unprecedented ability to expand the frontiers of medical knowledge. And if we choose to focus that ability on groups, which we've previously ignored, we have the potential to make medicine more equitable. This project also showcases some of the things we need to leverage that potential. It relies critically on a racially and socioeconomically diverse patient population to train the algorithm. And we show empirically that that improves our algorithm's performance. It also relies on training the algorithm to listen to the patient by trying to predict the patient's pain rather than merely seeking to replicate existing clinical knowledge. So choice of prediction target is critical here as it is in every machine learning task. And I think perhaps the biggest lesson of this work is that in evaluating algorithms, which of course are often flawed, we always have to compare the algorithm to the baseline world in which we currently exist, the world which would exist without the algorithm. And that world is deeply unfair and reliant on human decision-making, which is often biased and noisy. It's not like our algorithm does some fantastically magical job of predicting pain, but we're comparing to a baseline understanding of pain, which is very bad, and to a severity score, which was developed decades ago in heavily white British populations. And it's just not that hard to improve on those baselines. Please understand that I'm not insulting clinicians here. I have deep respect for clinicians, in part because my little sister is a clinician and she may be watching this and I'm a little scared of her. Uh, but every clinician I've ever spoken to recognizes the deep gaps which persist in our medical knowledge and the flaws which persist in our decision making. So this is the somewhat twisted reason I remain an algorithmic optimist because I've studied human decision making too. And as bad as algorithms can be, humans are even worse in many ways. At the same time, and this is the last point I want to make, uh, I think our, our, our knee project illustrates the obstacles we still need to overcome to close the gap between algorithm and academic paper and algorithm helping real patients. One big challenge that remains is interpretability when it comes to these algorithms. How do we figure out exactly what the algorithm is looking at when we're dealing with high dimensional complicated nonlinear models and make sure that it's nothing insidious? We did a lot of work in our paper to rule out obvious concerns, but frankly, that took a really long time. And even after that, I'd still like to pin down more precisely. Even if we are able to figure out what features our algorithms are using, we're still clearly deeply unresolved about what features we're comfortable with it using. For example, you know, we may discuss, is it okay to use race as a feature in a medical algorithm? And then a final big challenge is creating algorithmic interfaces which can aid human clinicians. How do we train algorithms and humans to work well together? How do we deploy algorithms gradually and in a way which doesn't harm patients while still rigorously assessing performance over time and across clinical sites? And how do we do that in consultation with patient communities who are, in the end, the people we're supposed to be helping? And more broadly, while centering a more diverse set of voices than we too, too often see in the machine learning and computer science community. So those are some of my thoughts on both sort of the potential of this work and the challenges that are really important to confront as we translate algorithms into, into clinical practice. I'm very much looking forward to the subsequent conversation.
Great, thank you, Emma, for your presentation. Um, Mercy, uh, could you go next? I'm able to start my video. Um, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Mercy Isiadu. I'm currently a postdoc at MIT, but also a co-founder of two companies, um, Gap Health Technologies and Color Health. And I think a lot of times we usually think about the data that is being used to um, develop AI algorithms and whether or not that data is biased. But um, I also think about the technology that is being used to gather this data that is being used to generate AI algorithms and who has access to that technology. So for instance, in healthcare, who has access to diagnostic technology such as mammography that may be used for downstream AI tasks. And, um, and, and if they don't have access, how is their data represented? So my, the work I'm going to present is how we reimagine technology such that it creates equitable access to care, but also creates equitable um, data representation. And just a few examples, um, I was working on a mammography project, um, which, is a, which was a multinational project um, during my postdoc. And we had countries from every continent except the African continent. So I tried to, through my links, to try to get some clinics that could give us some of these data sets um, to contribute to the AI model we're developing. And what I realized was that a lot of clinics mentioned their mammography, you know, devices have been broken down for what, the past four to five years. Um, and if for clinics where the mammography, where mammography was being done, getting the co corresponding um, pathology or health, health notes was very challenging. And finally, with um, the mammography project in particular, um, it wasn't being, screening wasn't being performed with mammography, un, unlike the context in the US, which was what we were developing our algorithm based on. It was actually more of a diagnostic tool, which would completely change our AI um, endpoints. So another example with Color Health, um, the other company I'm working with is creating accessible tools for cervical cancer screening. Currently in a lot of resource limited settings, cervical cancer screening is done by visualizing the cervix with the naked eye. Not only is this highly subjective and inaccurate, um, it also means there's no data to look at insights, patient history and use for machine learning predictions. So we are developing tools that can be more accessible um, to generate this data. And for gap health, um, what we are doing is really addressing the gap in electronic health records, because in a lot of low and middle income countries, they simply do not exist the way it does in the United States. And that makes data really hard to um, consolidate for these AI models, meaning there's hundreds of millions of people whose data is being left out because the technologies for collecting the data do not exist. Next. So I'll talk first about Gap Health, which is developing smart healthcare for chronic disease management. Next. Next. So for this venture, it's an extremely personal venture. Um, this is my co-founder's mother who actually passed away from complications of diabetes um, in Gambia. And while my co-founder, um, Bai Bintu, lived with her mother in Gambia, she helped her manage her disease, went with her to the clinics, um, took down notes, explained it to her mom. And after she left to pursue her education in Canada it was, and her siblings also left, it was very difficult um, for her mom to manage on her own, um, resulting in unmanaged diabetes, which resulted in her passing away. Next. And unfortunately, it's really challenging to see a patient's history and help them um, go through that history because electronic health records are extremely resource intensive. They require hardware, constant electricity, Wi-Fi, technical management that might not always exist. 
And what we want to do is simplify that and bring that to um, the patient's smartphone because mobile technology is currently at the heart of Sub-Saharan Africa's digital journey um, with a 66% adoption rate projected by 2025. Next. Um, and this is just what I'm talking about when I say EHRs are not what we are used to in the US. So lots of pen and paper forms in files that are very difficult to access to and to predict trends and understand um, patient history files. Next. So we are tackling chronic disease specifically because there's a rise in prevalence um, in the region and we are seeing gaps in care. So diabetes specifically is um, predicted to rise by 147% by 2045. And yet there isn't quality data to understand what's going on with these increasing trends and provide contextualized guidelines. A lot of guidelines are based off um, Western data, which might not necessarily be the same. And there's an additional broken care pipeline in connecting specialists to um, patients. Next. So we are providing a digital health wallet, decentralizing healthcare and data by allowing patients to reach specialist care and have their health records sent right through mobile, um, right on their mobile phones, be able to help track their health. And we provide them with data, not just the patients with data insights, but also provide institutions um, with more contextualized region specific um, insights. Next. And we see that this can really help to improve lifestyle by using patient data combined with health records to um, generate guide guidelines and um, recommendations. But not only that, um, in a lot of contexts, even in the United States, electronic health records are not entirely owned by the patient. Um, what the hospital decides to do with those records the patient doesn't have much of a say in. So we are actually giving pay, empowering patients to decide whether or not their records are used and receive a compensation for when their records are used. Next, please. Um, this is a beta version of our app with the um, clinician um, interface on the left and the patient interface on the right. Next, please. Um, and you also see a uh, telehealth functionality as well as uh, tra health tracking um, functionalities displayed on the screens here. Next. So we've already done some beta testing in Ghana and the Gambia and have received overall positive feedback. Um, and that's what we want to see. Um, a doctor in Ghana said it was very easy to use and 50 to 60% of their population would be able to use this. Um, but it's important to know that it's not only doctors who we tested with because we know that there's a very low doctor to patient ratio in the region. So we are actually opening this up, not just to doctors, but also to community health workers and nurses. Um, and a patient in Gambia who used this said it was very straightforward, very clear and uploading the documents was very simple and easy. So, um, I'll talk a bit more about color health and how we are using, how we are developing tools and algorithms for cervical cancer. Next, please. So can you go to the next slide, please? So cervical cancer um, affects 500,000 women each year and there's a 55% mortality rate. Majority of deaths that occur, um, occur in low and middle income countries because greater than 60% of women remained unscreened because of what um, I've been talking about that is it's resource intensive to do screening and to, the tools to do screening don't always exist. And yet it's an extremely slow growing and preventable and treatable disease. Next, please. So how we are doing at Color Health is developing tools that can be used by at the community level for visualizing and, and with an mHealth platform for HIPAA compliant data storage and tracking with decision-making algorithms. Next, please. 
Um, and these are some of the algorithms we use. So we initially started off using traditional machine learning algorithms because we had a very small data set. So we'd extract um, information from the cervix images that you can see and extract texture and color and actually found that we were able to get AUC's cost and sensitivities and um, specificities on par with providers using pathology as ground truth. Next. And true clinical studies um, across um, different, con different countries, we've been building up our database um, and transition to using deep neural networks, which have been able to generalize more and um, still provide us with the high sensitivities. Next. So the data for this is from, comes from Durham, right here, but also from clinical studies in Honduras, Peru, Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, and India and Ghana. And we are looking at ways that we can pass this data and understand um, how the data differs and how outcomes differ um, across the different countries we work in. So thank you for listening and I'd like to acknowledge our teams. Looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Marcy, for providing these use cases from a global perspective. Um, so um, before we move to remarks from our panelists, I just wanted to encourage the audience to submit questions in the Q&A box. Um, so now uh, we'll move to our panelists. So Jana, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so thank you for inviting me and thank you for the wonderful presentations that really got this um, session started off to such an interesting in such an interesting way. Um, so just to give you some context, I'm a neuroscientist at Duke University. And what I usually say is I'm a neuroscientist who's been adopted by data scientists and to some extent AI researchers. So as a neuroscientist, I study how humans make moral and ethical decisions. Um, and especially because I use a lot of computational tools when I study um, how humans make their, their moral decisions or human moral intelligence, it's been a natural extension to think about how artificial intelligences could be adapted to behave <clears throat> or make decisions that are more in line with our ethical and moral values. So along with my colleagues, Vincent Conitzer in CS and AI and Walterson Armstrong from philosophy, we've been working together in many different kinds of strategies and tools to make AI perform more ethically or to create AIs that help humans behave more ethically. And so um, I don't have any slides and I only have a couple minutes, but I thought I would mention one of these lines of work in the next few moments to give you a flavor of yet an another way or a couple of different ways AI can be used to mitigate bias or unfairness in addition to the wonderful, one wonderful ones we've heard about so far. Um, although the things I'll talk about will touch on some of the same themes we've, we've already heard about. Um, so much of our work has been motivated by problems related to the allocation of scarce medical resources. So these problems have become very familiar during the pandemic, of course, I and mean, it started off most famously with trying to figure out who would get a ventilator when um, they didn't have enough ventilators for all the people who, were, uh, who had COVID and who desperately needed a ventilator in order to live. Um, then, of course, it's moved on to many different other aspects, including who would get vaccine doses when we don't have enough vaccine doses to go around, and that's still a problem, of course. Um, so an, yet another type of scarce medical resource um, allocation problem that we think about um, is organ allocation and specifically kidney allocation. So many people or many more people need kidneys um, than there are kidney transplants available. And approximately 30% of kidney disease patients will either die or be removed from a transplant list before receiving a kidney because they, for example, become too sick. Um, so when a donor kidney becomes available, kind of the huge question is, which patient should be offered the kidney? And you might think, well, that's obvious. Uh, obviously, whoever is next on the list should be offered the kidney. Um, but both medically and psychologically, it's unfortunately not that simple. Um, so first of all, not all donor kidneys are compatible with all kidney recipients. They have to be comp have compatible blood types and compatible immune profiles. Uh, and compatibility is an all or nothing thing. Uh, it's not that you're just, yes, you're compatible or no, you're not. You could be kind of compatible and perhaps you can improve compatibility if you give certain types of drugs that um, suppress certain immune responses. So in the end, compatibility is often a judgment call and it's a judgment call with a lot of uncertainty around it. In addition, uh, not all kidneys that are donated are in perfect shape. They may be old or have some damage, or perhaps they come from people who have um, smoked a lot or drank a lot, which can impact your kidney function. And potential um, recipients and their donors are generally motivated to get, get the best kidney they can. 
So what many people don't know is sometimes a doctor and patient team, in fact, this often happens, will choose to reject a kidney that's offered to them because they want to take the risk of waiting for one that might be in even better shape or perhaps might be more compatible. So who gets the kidney, as we often describe it in our lab, is actually a very complex question. And um, interestingly, it's often determined by just a few individual human decision makers, often quickly in very stressful situations. Um, so the problem is that as important as these decisions are, after all, they truly affect life and death, um, they're also the types of decisions that humans are worst at. We're not very good at making ethical decisions in risky probability-laden contexts, especially those with a lot of uncertainty or when we're tired or under um, time pressure. Our prediction, predictions are not very accurate in those contexts. And unfortunately, these are also the types of decisions where um, our implicit biases are most likely to come out and rear their ugly heads. And indeed, that's been documented in kidney allocation decisions. So for example, um, doctors are much more likely to choose to reject kidney offers from African-American women, especially obese African-American women than other groups. And um, they underestimate the quality of kidneys from African-Americans much more than can be explained by any type of statistical or relevant medical factor. So it's currently thought that this pattern is due to doctors' implicit unconscious bias against these groups. And to be clear, most doctors and transplant teams don't intentionally discriminate against groups like African-American women, of course. They just have these unconscious biases um, that influence their decision-making and they just don't know it. The problem is tragically, the result of these biases, um, not directly, but is that about 20% of all donor kidneys actually get thrown away instead of being used to save people's lives. And many patients die instead of accepting a kidney that could have saved their lives. And this is actually even more a problem in the US than in other countries. Um, it's been, been documented. So we think AI tools can help humans uh, make more ethical and unbiased decisions in these types of contexts. And so in our group, we're working on AI tools that will help show decision makers their own implicit biases in unthreatening ways. Um, and we're also trying to create AIs that can make, these are more rule-based um, AIs, but um, creating AIs that can make allocation decisions based on the values decision makers say they want to follow. So explicitly the, the values that they say are important to them, like of course, fairness and equity, so that we can show decision makers when their intuitions and implicit judgments um, conflict with their explicitly stated values. And so we can flag those judgments as ones they might wanna reconsider. Other groups are working on tools that can help reduce bias in these um, types of allocation situations in other slightly more indirect ways, like making um, tools that can predict the compatibility of an offered kidney with a specific patient or predicting how long it will take for a better or more compatible kidney to become available. And the hope, um, and at least so far, the evidence shows that these prediction tools should be and are currently more objective and resilient to bias than human decision makers. Although of course, they're going to be influenced by many of the things we've heard about earlier, like bias training data. So I know I'm about out of time. I'll just wrap by, by saying that I think AI has a lot of potential to help clinicians and decision makers become aware of their implicit biases and to learn to overcome them so that we can make decisions that are more in line with their explicit beliefs about fairness and equity. And I look forward to hearing um, your questions and your comments during the discussion. Thank you. Great, and thank you, Jenna, for raising um, the, the lens of, of morality and ethics into the, the conversation. So next, uh, we will hear from Sonu Tadani and Zrani. So Sonu. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the great presentations. I want to zoom out a bit on the world of AI and actually start with a quote by Kate Crawford in her book called Atlas of AI, where she argues that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent, and rather it actually requires vast amounts of natural resources and human labor, infrastructure, projects with massive logistical demands, and it depends entirely on a wider set of political and social structures and capital to build it and scale it. And thus, it is actually designed to serve the existing dominant interests. And in this sense, artificial intelligence is actually a registry of power. And the reason that matters is because, you know, AI, as you've been hearing, we look at past data, past experiences, and bring humans to the table to define a problem that needs to be solved and then use the past to predict the future. And our past, as we well know, has colonialism, various forms of supremacy, white or male or human, capitalism, so on and so forth, which means um, there's talk about fairness in algorithms, there's talk about equity. I really think that the world of AI needs to entwine justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion from the very onset to the end 
in order to deliver impact versus intent. All of us know what diversity, equity, and inclusion are, and I would argue that justice, which we've heard the term thrown in a few times today, really asks whose ideas are not going to be taken seriously because they're not in the majority, or Kate Crawford would argue don't have the power or are not at the tables of power. And it is these people whose safety will be sacrificed and minimized. My biggest fear, having spent 25 years in tech in the last dozen plus year at Stanford, is that unless we entwine justice, going beyond bias and fairness, et cetera, we will at least in healthcare end up in a world where those of us with privilege will have even better concierge care of some kind, and the rest will have kiosk care and the chaos that goes with it. Um, the year 2020 in San Francisco created more millionaires than it ever has in the past. It also increased the homeless population by the largest number. In healthcare, you know, people talk about the social determinants of health. I argue that these are actually structural determinants of health, which is why we end up with what some call the house that racism built. And it's important to understand the difference between race and racism. You know, race is a social construct. It defines groups by skin color and physical traits. And historically, race was wrongly perceived to be based on biology and was wrongly and frequently used to suppress and oppress certain groups of people. Racism, on the other hand, is the marginalization or oppression of people of color based on socially constructed racial hierarchies and privileges of a dominant group. So in, when you have race-based versus race-conscious medicine, all of which one needs to unpack and understand as one develops these things, is that race is ill-defined. It's interfered to have biological significance. You've heard examples of that today. Whereas race conscious medicine defines race as a social and power construct, the effects of structural racism are analyzed and thus the consequences on racism understood, taught and engaged around and then providing support to overcome these structural barriers of health to actually reduce racial health inequities. And I understand, you know, when we're, as, when we are accustomed to privilege, equality will feel like oppression. And that's a reality. My fear is that we have a healthcare oligarchy in our nation today. And if we leave AI tech and innovation without demanding a focus on justice, we will further exacerbate these inequities. And lacking governance and guardrails, I think we need common sense uh, to do what you all know Harari talks about where he says humans are always far better at inventing tools than using them wisely. And the question is, what does it mean to use them wisely? Some of the examples you heard today looked at, you know, skin and kidneys and various other situations. There is a lot of data that we can actually look at to look at how we've done things historically in a way that has not served, say, women or people of color, et cetera. Um, Ambien, for instance, was a drug on the market for nearly 21 years before in 2013, the FDA did the research and came out with and cut the dosage for the sleep aid to half for women because it left them drowsy in the morning. Are there other opportunities like that lying in these data sets we already have? So I would argue, take courage and common sense prioritize and entwine what I call JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, scholars and leaders, and bring them to the tables of power to focus not on profit efficiency and other narrow lenses, but to address justice. I'll stop there. Wonderful, thank you Sonu uh, for centering on justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, as well as raising um, structural determinants of health and, race and racism in the conversation. So I think this is a really great segue into our group discussion. Um, again, I just wanna remind the audience if you have other questions to um, place them in the Q&A. So we've talked about um, uneven landscape for decision-making, how machine learning can overcome provider biases, technology to gather data, 
and ended on ways to embed moral and ethical perspectives uh, into AI and combine that with the Jedi principles that Sonu uh, just laid out. So what other health equity gaps could AI be used for addressing injustice? And a related question to that as well is, could AI be used outside of a traditional clinical context altogether? So take it away. I'm happy to try to address that. Um, the example you heard me use was Ambien. Um, and the reality is that, you know, after it had been on the market for two decades, there were lots of incidents and documented information about how women were being, uh, were paying a heavier price for taking that dosage based purely on weight but, and, and ignoring the sex slash gender component of things. Can AI actually instead focus at historical data and say, where are the medical errors? What are the causes of those medical errors? Where are the adverse uh, outcomes? What are the demographics for which those uh, adverse outcomes matter? And then use that to, un to, to uncover and do things differently in terms of diagnosis, treatment, or focusing on what we do. As long as our focus is on how do we make healthcare efficient? How do we reduce cost? Um, my fear is that many of us on the screen are not going to end up in healthcare systems that are looking to reduce costs because we will have some version of you know, quarterback MDs in our lives that help us navigate a healthcare system or uh, have concierge care. And people like my mother and grandmothers who were refugees and immigrants, their 21st, first, 21st century versions will not have that. And then we will end up with what we have today where a pandemic continues to be an ongoing endemic because um, unless all of us are safe, none of us are safe. Um, I think AI has powerful applications to increase equity in public health outside of the healthcare system. So for example, just to build on the example of the pandemic, you know, we're seeing now sort of the growth of, of powerful uh, models which forecast the spread of the pandemic with varying success. But I think one thing that these models allow us to do as they grow increasingly fine-grained um, is, is simulate specifically the impact of various policies on underserved populations. We've looked at some of this in our previous work um, and, and shown that basically the infection dynamics of the disease are qualitatively different in different neighborhoods. And it's thus important to choose reopening policies that don't just benefit the population as a whole, you know, that aren't just like efficient in some overall sense, but are also equitable in the sense that they don't uh, uh, further harm already overburdened populations. And you can imagine you know, applying this to disease forecasting, but also to other policy decisions like where should we place vaccine sites and other things like this. And so I think uh, you know, machine learning and AI approaches um, offer powerful potential to policymakers to sort of more equitably make decisions. Yeah, I think that the use of the smartphone by people in the home is going to obviously change the world and everybody has access to a smartphone and the question is who's going to control the data and the, the justice of the data and you know my concern of course is that data is all just you know you're the data when things are free and most people aren't willing to pay for their health information they expect it to be free and if it's free then big corporations control the data so that's a real danger spot, but then there's also a huge opportunity because, you know, um, even in the poorest countries, lots of people have smartphones and we can drive information to people where they are at the home and we can improve health and circumvent the traditional medical system. So th there's a lot of promise there. And, you know, the Gates Foundation has been looking at this. We were funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to create a stored to the um, Android phone version because in low income settings, data is so expensive that it's a real barrier to give a software application that requires internet traffic to someone that has to pay a lot of money for data. So they're interested, the Gates Foundation has been interested in creating that super a tool for people to use in low income settings. and you know, that's an opportunity. So there's challenges, there's opportunities, but I, I really believe the smartphone is, is really the game changer in healthcare. Great, and our, 
thanks for raising actually that point on democratizing data. I wanted to actually turn to Mercy quickly to hear your thoughts on what you see as the future of who owns the data and who makes decisions about um, where and how that data are used. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So um, working in my field, um, to get data, you have to go to clinics, you have to go to an IRB, and then you're approved to use a certain amount of data. And technically, patients don't own their data and don't control their data. But we feel like um, patients should control, similar to how on your driver's license, you can decide whether or not your body can be used for scientific purposes after you're dead, patients should be able to indicate whether or not their data can be used for research purposes or other purposes to be able to improve their own lifestyles, but also to improve um, general public health. But should we also believe that patients to a certain extent should be compensated for that. Um, of course, um, one person's data on its own is not useful or, or is not um, worth much, but when it comes as an together as an aggregate, that's where it's worth a lot. So if a patient has you know, good data that is being used in an aggregate for some kind of clinical trial or some pharmaceutical use um, that is being compensated, um, the patient should at least get some kind of return in terms of credits or points. Um, and we are implementing this with gut health, gut health um, but we believe that it should be implemented um, across the board when it comes to healthcare so that patients truly own their health. Great, thanks Marcy. Um, so, and I wanted to actually open that up also to others um, on, on the, the panel to see if you had thoughts on that. I have to agree with Marcy, you know, I go back to this concept of AI is actually an atlas of power which includes the data that is used for anything that's done in AI. And the reality is that, you know, it's one thing to use the data for research. It's another thing when the data is monetized. And back to Marcy's point, when you start monetizing what is otherwise quote unquote free, um, what is, you know, what is the moral rudder of what's the right thing to do there? You can wait for governance. We can wait for whistleblowers. Um, we can wait for ProPublica. We have common sense. You know, we should be able to look ourselves in the eye and say, I did this and these are the right reasons. And this is why I did it. So if we're gonna monetize data, it might be difficult to monetize at the individual level, but you can certainly monetize at the group level or at the population level. I, I guess I can offer uh, just some quick reflections, although they're not uh, very optimistic. So Andrea, I think you asked, where are we headed? Uh, not where should we head. Um, and so out of all the things related to AI, I think data privacy is the thing I am least optimistic about and that I'm actually quite pessimistic about. I think it is almost impossible to put it all, get everything back in a place where we are actually following the, what I think should be the moral and, val moral and ethical values that we should be using um, to determine who should get access to data. And I think also technology has gotten to such a point that it is, it's very hard to keep data private, truly, because once you share enough different types of data, you can use different types of models to put it back together and reconstruct it. Um, so I, it's, where are we headed? I don't think we're headed in a great place. Where should we be headed? Some place better, but even where we should be headed, I think is, um, it's a hard thing to obtain. So it's, it's the thing I'm most pessimistic about and sad about, I feel like it's, uh, and there aren't too many people who care about privacy these days. I feel like, I feel like everyone's given up. I still care, but. Great, thanks, Jenna. Go ahead. Oh, um, I was gonna say, yeah. Oh, go sorry. ahead, Emma. Yeah, so so from a sort of computer science standpoint, I, so, so privacy is, is clearly important and vital um, to preserve. I think very important for sort of uh, moving forward the state of the art in terms of building algorithms that help people is the creation of anonymous and sort of shared resources um, that everyone can access that are diverse and that have sort of machine learning tasks that will actually help people. So in machine learning, we've seen, for example, one of the reasons we've enjoyed such huge progress in some domains is that there are large publicly available data sets. Um, and in medicine, those are very hard to get access to uh, unless you sort of you know, have privileged access, you have, you know, this you, the AI being a registry of power, like you have the access to sort of 
in inside sources that can be very hard to get access to. So I think democratizing access to data with suitable de-identification, obviously, um, will be very important from a scientific standpoint to sort of aiding reproducibility, pushing the field forward in a rigorous way. Um, and I and and there are people who are working on this now, and I think that's very important. I'd like to actually uh, chime in a bit on that. And I know where we're headed is, you know, whistleblowers and ProPublica or some iteration of all that, because that seems to be a pattern as humans. Having spent 25 years in tech and continuing to be involved in it in some way, shape and form, in the world of product development, there are checks and balances from a finance perspective. There are checks and balances from a legal and risk management perspective. I would argue there should be checks and balances from a Jedi perspective. You know, the world of the murder of George Floyd has led to a lot of commitment to what is generally called DEI. I would argue, let's talk the talk and walk the walk. So part of walking the walk is to prevent things rather than waiting for an Obamaya lab to tell us how we goofed up. So have a Jedi check in terms of designing what problems we wanna solve with AI, why and how, and at those power tables of power engage a Jedi check and balance and give them the power to veto. I'll just add two cents to that. I know this is going in a slightly different direction, but I, I couldn't agree more. And I would just add, it's not just one check and I'm sure you didn't actually mean just one check. It needs to be integrated throughout the entire product development process and not just the product development process, the product application process because few AI products can just be used out of the box for every application. So it really, Jedi, this kind of concept of embedding Jedi checks, but really it's just an evaluation in the same way you would evaluate, again, like you said, legal considerations and financial considerations. Jedi concepts have to be at the table, at least as high as the others. And I would argue, of course, but not everyone would agree above the others, but it has to be embedded every step of the way at the technical side, at the um, leadership side, on the financial side, everywhere. It can't just be one, one kind of ethics board that you know tries their best to say, wait, 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 hold on. It really has to be embedded. Thanks, Jenna. And Art, did you want to go? Yeah, well, I just couldn't agree more with Sonu on this comment about substan substantive activities. Um, we've seen it, you know, we've been working on cognitive biases for 20 years. And after the George Floyd tragedy, I'd separate the reach outs we've had from industry and from academia both as either performative or substantive. And I had a very, very bright young medical student say to me, you know, a lot of this is just performance. It's just performative, this DEI talk. And so, um, you know, this is a long game. This is not a year and a half. This is like decades of commitment we have to make to have social change. And medicine is slow. And, you know, what people say to me over the years, doctors will do this and doctors will do that. I say, you act like doctors are some monolithic homogenous group. You have some people that are some physicians that are really change agents, creative forces that are out to change medicine. And on the other side, you have total laggards and everything in between. And so if you're trying to just change the medical education system, that's not overnight. I've been at it for 20 years, trying to get doctors to think about augmented intelligence that we're not gonna play the game of memorization. We're gonna play the game of using better information to improve decisions equitably. And there are a lot of clinicians that just need to retire because they're never gonna change. They are never gonna change. So it's the long game. And I'm glad that we have this group that's committed to the long game. Nart, thanks for uh, raising that point, especially around medical education. And, and as we've discussed, right, um, even if AI alerts uh, clinicians of potential circumstances of bias, providers might not act on, on those data. So I wanted to open up the conversation to the panel of how can stakeholders ensure that um, they will act on, on the data that, that they're seeing? Just one, I just got to say one other point. It's, it's a matter of not doing what I say, but doing what I do. And so you need teachers that are modeling good information acquisition and how to use these tools for the students and residents. Right now, we have an educational system that rewards students for passing their boards and memorization. You have to have leaders and academic leaders 
that are actually doing it themselves. And until you have people modeling good information acquisition and good information processing, we won't change a thing. I agree with that. What I would add is also modeling the fact that we're human. And because we're human, we're all capable of being biased and thus being willing to listen and learn and be humble. Um, humility and being able to say to your patient, I don't know, but I'm going to work with you to figure it out instead of acting like you're an all-knowing oracle all the time and that you have a diagnosis. So those that are engaged in the field of clinical reasoning and diagnostic errors, humility, that's what we talk about at the diagnostic errors meeting all the time is humility with our patients and explaining to patients that diagnosis isn't always discovered immediately. It's a process. So I couldn't agree more with humility and, and the need for physicians to embrace humility. Great, thanks Art. And Jenna, in a, a previous conversation, we talked a bit about quality measures. So I wanted to hear from you about how AI could be incorporated into quality measures to uh, lead to some re um, remediation measures. Sure. Um, so I always have a struggle. I think sometimes I'm too much in the weeds to answer general questions. Uh, so I'll make that as a caveat um, because AI problems usually you're usually addressing a very specific problem rather than a general problem. Um, so the kind of the question of how can you use AI to address quality and auditing is a very big question. So the, the answers are all going to be on individual basis. Um, but it can be on multiple levels. And I think we've probably heard about some of them. So there's at, at the kind of the broader level. Um, it can be using AI to actually audit data sets and, and do, and you don't have to use AI for that. There are other statistical ways that aren't necessarily AI, but um, to, to audit data sets and give a sense of what the, um, where the data sets might be biased, also in, in usage patterns. Um, and then there are much more kind of nuanced, specialized things. And I think this is probably what you're referring to, Andrea, is that um, we're working on some things in our lab, for example, about how can you use AI in telehealth to be able to uh, estimate empathy that a clinician is giving to their patients. And we know that decades and decades of data show us that uh, white doctors, whether they know it or not, tend to give less empathy to those who look different from them. Um, and as a consequence, many, especially in the African-American community, trust the health system less, which leads to all of these other downstream negative effects. Um, so one of the things we're working on, like I said, is how, how can we give both feedback and training, but it has to, I think the critical thing that relates to humility in some ways, although it's um, obviously a different context, is we not, don't just have to acknowledge that we're all biased. We have to acknowledge that we all mess up sometimes. So the problem, I think sometimes when we try to solve these AI problems is we kind of scapegoat people, but because like you've used this AI wrong or you this model must be biased and therefore we have to undermine everything you've ever done. And so I think it can make doctors and health systems very defensive when we try to incorporate these tools and something like empathy, it we've definitely already, as we've tried to you know, work with stakeholders, have already encountered that. So how? So we're trying to make tools that um, are not threatening, but that can give clinicians and systems at an aggregate level very concrete feedback about what kinds of empathy, what kinds of compassion, what kind of support is being demonstrated in these telehealth contexts um, so that they can be addressed. And we, our model suggests that that should dramatically impact the quality of care for especially those in underserved um, um, populations. I'll build on what you just said, uh, Jana. And, you know, we're all sitting on a screen for two years and going. And vaccines didn't convert to vaccinations. And the reason they didn't convert to vaccinations was, wasn't because the science of the vaccines wasn't what it is, which is awesome. Um, it was because of these other things like trust, like historical trauma, um, and so on and so forth. And I think when you take a tool like AI, I think part of it is to ask, how can you solve the problems that are messy and difficult, which require new answers, which require more custom tailoring, which require a differential way of engaging each patient, not just from the diagnostic perspective, but also in terms of the human perspective. In the end, every patient is a human and the ecosystem of 
caregivers around them, both family, friends, and otherwise are humans. And the people who give the care are humans as well as everyone surrounding them as a human. And given that, can there be AI tools that actually help us be better at building trust, at understanding the other person, at uh, taking the cognitive load of what it means to actually engage with uh, art versus a Sonu versus uh, Jana versus anybody else, such that that customization can lead to the impact we all want. You know, far too often we focus on how can we make this on market share and profitability. And as long as our focus is there, we will fail. Whereas if our focus is on Jedi or some iteration of that, it will address a different problem, but we could end up getting more vaccinations on top of vaccines. Yeah. And Sonu, thank you for, for ending on that note of, of um, embedding Jedi um, in, our, in our current um, challenges that we're facing today. So um, this was a really wonderful discussion and I thank um, all the presenters and panelists uh, to, uh, who joined us today. Um, so we'll be moving on to our final session of the day, um, which is the Federal Agency Roundtable, uh, which will be moderated by Mark McClellan, who's the director of Duke Margolis and former FDA commissioner. Mark? Uh, Andrea, thanks very much. And I wanna thank the, the previous panel, all of our panels for uh, all of the extensive and timely discussion today. Um, we're gonna cap this off with turning to a federal agency roundtable. So this is an opportunity for all of us to hear from speakers from a range of agencies about their initiatives to mitigate bias and in artificial intelligence and to discuss some of these issues. And I really appreciate all of our federal partners taking the time to be here. Our panelists today include Elm Tabasi, who is the chief Chief of Staff in the Information Technology Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Robin Wetherill, who's an attorney in the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection at the Federal Trade Commission, Matthew Diamond, a Chief Medical Officer for Digital Health at FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the Food and Drug Administration, and Stephen Kanya, the Senior Advisor to the Deputy National Coordinator and Innovation Portfolio Lead for the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT in the Department of Health and Human Services. Each of them is going to start with some opening comments on uh, some of their agency activities. And then we're going to go from there for a discussion. And again, we encourage uh, people to submit uh, questions and comments via uh, Q&A. Um, so let me start by turning to Ellen. OK, thank you. I can't turn on my uh, video. I don't know why, but uh, mm -hmm. Oh, okay, it, it now allows me to do that. Okay, thank you. thank you. I wanna start by uh, thank you, uh, Mark and everyone for this kind invitation. Uh, and I'm glad to be here speaking with all of you. I'm sorry that I missed some of the sessions earlier today, something happened, but uh, I'll start by saying a few words about this and some of the things that we're doing and bias part of that. Um, as industries, uh, National Laboratory NIS has a broad portfolio of research I, uh, along with a long-standing reputation of cultivating trust in technology. And we do that by participating in development of standards and metrics that strengthen measurement science and make technology more secure, usable, interoperable, reliable, or in other words, more trustworthy. And this work we think is critical in AI space to ensure public trust of this rapidly evolving technology as we heard a lot about uh, some of this uh, problem in the healthcare today. Uh, but certainly myself and all of us at NIST, we believe that AI have the potential to uplift and empower all people. Yet the use of AI technologies could have risks to individuals, to organizations and societies. And uh, <clears throat> globally, researchers, developers, consumers all have expressed their desire and need to understand the technical and societal risks related to AI technologies uh, globally and nationally. There has been many discussions about development of the principles for AI. We heard some of these things today. We want AI to be trustworthy, responsible, ethical, fair, just. Um, and while the policy landscape that governs this area will continue to evolve across borders, uh, we at NIST seek to provide scalable research-based methods to understand and assess risks 
and ultimately advance trustworthy approaches to AI that serve all people in responsible, equitable, and beneficial ways. And one of those, um, I, I, you know, I should really say opportunity for us, the tech community is that uh, while there is a lot of interest in, uh, again, trustworthy, responsible AI, uh, AI that's fair, that's just, that's uh, non-discriminatory, um, there, there, has, there hasn't been a concerted effort to uh, define taxonomy of risk, to take all of those high level principle value-based statements into technical or socio-technical terms that the designer, developers, evaluators, policymaker can use them to design, develop, test, evaluate, audit AI systems. Uh, here at NIST, we have been producing a series of reports on characteristics of trustworthy AI. We start by uh, 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 trying to uh, unpack uh, what constitutes trust, what are the core building blocks of a trustworthy AI, um, a, and then for each of them, try to bring the community together uh, uh, on a shared understanding of what each of them means. So example of recent publications cover characteristics such as accuracy, security or resilience. So AI uh, is resilient to many of the different vulnerabilities that have been reported in the community. Explainability and interpretability, that's extremely important in many of the uh, medical and healthcare cases. Um, and then explainability to who, at what level. The issue of the bias, which is the topic of this uh, conversations today, uh, what bias means is bias only the statistical bias in terms of the disparity, you know, demographic disparity or those different changes or, or there are more meaning into the bias. We have a paper out um, in uh, early in summer on uh, a proposal for managing bias in AI uh, uh, followed by a, a period of public comment that closed in September and we are in a consultation mode on revising that document. Uh, but also issues such as privacy, preserving machine learning. Uh, many of us have seen the uh, papers that show that uh, many of these deep learning models basically memorize the data. So we are using patient data in developing a model, the risk of the privacy is, is serious. Um, and more specifically, we have launched a consensus-driven, open, transparent, collaborative process to develop an AI risk management framework. Uh, the AI risk management framework aims to um, uh, talk about the different uh, aspects of the AI risk, uh, uh, so kind of uh, understanding the context, enumerating the different risks, um, uh, guidance about measuring each of them and the trade-off among, among the different components of risk and solutions for uh, mitigating, understanding, communicating, uh, sharing uh, uh, in one word, managing those risks. Um, we had a request for information out. Uh, we get uh, some really, really good comments and input. Uh, we followed that by a workshop in October and uh, a concept paper we posted at the uh, beginning of this week. We in invite and encourage uh, um, national, international stakeholders and collaborative in this process. I will put the link to the concept paper out and I uh, would like to hear from all of you on that. Very quickly, I said that NIST has a very broad portfolio of research. Our researchers across different laboratories at NIST, including uh, our researchers that are working on material sciences and biotech uh, are, are uh, applying AI to measurement problems that they are working on uh, to not only gain a deeper insight and better understanding uh, uh, of AI ca capabilities and limitations, but also how to advance the field. Um, and uh, the, the last thing that I want to say is that our participations in development of the standards and guidelines, standards that are technically sound, uh, scientifically valid, and fit for purpose standards that are timely that can further AI innovation and trust in systems that use AI. And I close by saying that and emphasizing that NIST plans and carries out its AI work in close collaborations with the whole community, uh, leveraging the work of others. And, uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is an invitation for uh, more conversations and, and uh, participations in development of the AI risk management framework. I stop here uh, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, th thanks very much, Ellen. We covered a, a lot of ground. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Robin Weatherill. Uh, Robin? Hi, is everyone able to see and hear me? Yes, just fine. Okay, um, my video has had frozen, so um, I was 
briefly concerned that I had just lost the connection at a key moment, but it appears not. Um, so I want to start by thanking you, Mark, and, and thanking the Duke Margolis Center for having me today. I'm very happy to be here. I'm an attorney with the Federal Trade Commission's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection, which sits within the Bureau of Consumer Protection. Um, and just for clarity, I am speaking for myself today and not for uh, not on behalf of the commission or any individual commissioner. So for those who may not be familiar, the FTC is a civil law enforcement agency charged with protecting consumers and ensuring fair economic competition. Um, as I said, I sit on the consumer protection side of the house, so that's the primary perspective I'll be speaking to today. Um, and the FTC's jurisdiction is quite broad and generally includes most of the U.S. economy with a few notable carve-outs like banks, insurance companies, and most nonprofit organizations. Um, so the FTC's primary tools for, for protecting consumers uh, in the AI space and generally are its enforcement powers under the FTC Act, um, which very broadly prohibits unfair and deceptive acts or practices. And it's important to understand that even though the FTC Act is over 100 years old, its requirements are technology neutral. So as an example of that, I work in a division that focuses primarily on data privacy and security, uh, which I think it's fair to say were much less of a concern in 1914 when the FTC Act was passed. Um, so I'm gonna uh, spend a little bit of time briefly explaining what the words deception and unfairness mean um, in the context of the FTC Act and how those might play out in the AI space and, and with relevance to AI bias in particular. Uh, so the FTC's deception authority allows it to hold businesses accountable when they make false or unsubstantiated claims about their products and services. And I think unsubstantiated is a really key word when we're talking about something like AI, because the law says not only that businesses cannot make false claims, but that they have to have substantiation, sufficient evidence to support their marketing claims at the time those claims are made. Um, and the exact amount of evidence that's sufficient is, is context specific. But, um, you know, for example, if someone is making claims about the ability of their product to uh, reduce bias, there has to be some evidentiary basis for those claims or they, um, they may run afoul of the FTC Act. So one AI related example is a case the FTC brought in 2015 against the developer of a consumer facing mobile app called Mole Detective, which um, claimed to be able to analyze photographs of moles and determine whether those moles were cancerous. And the FTC alleged in that case that the company didn't have any evidence to back up those claims. And as a result, they were deceptive in violation of the FTC Act. Another example that I think is interesting, uh, maybe especially from the bias perspective, is a case from way back in 2008 called CompuCredit, where a company um, allegedly had made a, a marketing offer of credit lines up to a certain amount, but failed to disclose that it would uh, monitor consumer purchasing activity for a certain period and then could reduce the available amount of credit based on that data using um, some kind of algorithm or model. So there you have an instance where the company is making this marketing claim, but in fact, that claim is not true for all consumers because of the way this algorithm is operating. So you know, maybe that can apply for um, some other uh, algorithm, uh, AI-related contexts. And um, I can pause there for now. Great. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Robin, for those uh, for those opening comments. And um, next, I'd like to turn to uh, Matthew Diamond from uh, FDA. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, just fine. Great. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And again, uh, my name is Matt Diamond. I serve as the Chief Medical Officer for Digital Health, uh, working in our uh, Center of Excellence in Digital Health and the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at FDA. And I might actually uh, share one uh, screen, one slide, um, while I am uh, saying a few words, just in one second. Um, let me know if you're able to... Um, We're seeing the top of your PowerPoint file. <laughs> all right, sorry, just one second. Let's see if... Uh, just one sec. Um, 
So I will just try that um, one more time. Uh, just a second. One second. Okay. about that? We go. Is that better? Great. Okay. So, um, and is that, is that even better? That's even better. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. So it, it's really been a great discussion today and, and glad to, uh, to be a part of it. Um, you know, the issue of uh, bias and fairness in AI enabled healthcare technology is a really important topic and a priority. Uh, for the center and uh, for the agency. Um, we believe that these technologies um, offer a great opportunity uh, to have a significant positive impact uh, on healthcare, but they also offer uh, unique considerations. And I want to talk briefly about uh, some of our work uh, in this area. And uh, most importantly, to put out an open invitation uh, to collaborate with all of you uh, to help uh, ensure that these technologies are not worsening uh, healthcare disparities, and instead to support ways that these technologies can uh, actually promote health equity. And so uh, one of um, the important pieces uh, here is uh, what's shown uh, surrounded by yellow, our uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning medical device software action plan that we put out at the beginning of this year. And an important part of this plan is to foster a patient-centered approach, including uh, transparency um, for users of medical devices and uh, specifically to promote an, an approach that uh, takes into account uh, issues like uh, equity and accountability, trust, uh, bias, and usability of these devices. Um, if you look at the left side of the slide, um, we put out a discussion paper um, to present a proposed regulatory framework um, that would be tailored for artificial intelligence and machine learning enabled uh, devices and really to elicit uh, feedback uh, from the public uh, on how a total product lifecycle based approach uh, could be used for these technologies that uh, have a naturally uh, iterative uh, life cycle as uh, was, has been discussed earlier uh, today. Uh, moving from left to right, um, we joined uh, our first collaborative uh, community related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and for those of you who may not be aware of um, this mechanism, there are now about 12 collaborative communities that FDA participates in, uh, in many different areas, and some of which um, have a focus on machine learning and um, specifically on a bias uh, data and uh, imaging uh, in medical devices. Um, we held a public workshop uh, specifically on radiological imaging and the issues around uh, the level of autonomy of these devices. And I, I'm highlighting um, these because many of these resources are still available online on the FDA website, and uh, I hope that they can be uh, a resource for this effort. Um, uh, in uh, the end of uh, last year, we held a, a patient engagement advisory committee or peak meeting um, specifically to get input from patients on trust uh, in these devices. And all of this input and input from other uh, meetings and mechanisms went into um, the strategy that we laid out in our action plan um, that I just mentioned. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we put out a list of currently marketed uh, machine learning enabled medical devices, uh, and that was uh, to help provide our own transparency to the public uh, about these devices and our work um, on them. Um, we held a public workshop specifically on transparency. I know many of you participated um, and, you know, making sure that users have the right information uh, about their devices is an important part in uh, recognizing, uh, mitigating, and managing um, bias. As, and I think that uh, that was uh, articulated very uh, elegantly earlier today with the idea that um, the information that we need as a regulatory agency is different than the information that a healthcare provider would need about a device, uh, which is different than the information that a user uh, who's a patient uh, might need about a medical device. And then I also want to highlight, uh, I think Eric may have alluded to this as well with his work at, at Xavier, um, our uh, promotion of good machine learning practice. Uh, and just um, a few weeks ago, uh, we were able to issue in collaboration uh, with uh, our uh, partners in the UK and, and in Canada, 
uh, a set of guiding principles for good machine learning practice to help support um, uh, medical devices that are, are safe, effective, and, uh, and, and high quality. So um, we, we welcome uh, you know, further input on these plans um, you know, in our action plan, and you can see the five parts listed here uh, on the bottom of the slide from left to right, um, updating our regulatory framework, uh, promoting good machine learning practice, as I mentioned, um, uh, fostering a patient-centered approach, supporting uh, regulatory science uh, efforts, uh, and also advancing real-world performance pilots. Uh, it also has been mentioned today, uh, the role of understanding how these products are functioning uh, in the real world after um, they're introduced into the market and to make sure uh, that uh, their performance is not degrading with, with different uh, shifts uh, in, in data and, and clinical uh, context. And maybe if I can take just one minute to address a, a few common myths um, that I think may help to inform the discussion and the work uh, moving forward. Um, I'll, I'll try to run through them pretty quickly, um, but I, I hear these uh, frequently. Uh, myth one, um, that many AIML products are not regulated by anyone. And, uh, you know, whereas uh, the FDA regulates a subset of uh, products that meet the definition of a medical device, um, you know, uh, to what, um, to what Robin uh, mentioned earlier and, and the, the presence of the FTC and ONC at, at, this, um, at this conference is really a testament to um, that even if a product is not actively regulated by the FDA, uh, there are other agencies and uh, other regulations uh, that govern uh, those products. Uh, myth number two, uh, that some AML products are not regulated by FDA if they focus just on prevention. Um, and whereas we do have some uh, policies to promote um, products um, and to promote an understanding of um, the, our uh, jurisdiction over products that promote general wellness, um, uh, products that uh, prevent uh, conditions or, or illnesses um, may very well uh, fall under uh, our uh, jurisdiction and meet the definition of uh, a medical device. And I'd be happy to... Uh, you know, speak with folks uh, individually and, and uh, collectively on our general wellness uh, policies. Uh, myth number three, that uh, clinical decision support as a class of products is not regulated by FDA, um, and, and that's simply not true. Um, you know, there is uh, clinical decision port support products that uh, meet the definition device and some uh, that don't. And, uh, and again, there's um, uh, separate guidance, uh, both uh, issued in draft and under development in final form um, that uh, goes into more details about uh, this information. Uh, and then finally, myth number four, um, and again, I've heard this, that there's no guidance on AIML medical devices. And, um, and actually, there's a good amount of guidance on AIML medical devices. Um, you know, many of the uh, general guidances uh, that the agency has put out uh, both on um, software and also, for example, on um, ensuring uh, the evaluation and reporting of age, race, and ethnicity-specific data in medical device clinical studies. Um, uh, you know, these are very applicable uh, for uh, understanding bias in uh, machine learning-enabled uh, devices. And the agency has also put out some specific guidance on some of the most common machine learning products, including uh, the image analysis products um, used in radiological um, the workflows. So um, I've listed uh, here uh, our uh, website on the lower left for the Digital Health Center of Excellence, also an email address uh, for a, uh, that you can write to if you have questions, if uh, you'd like to uh, some assistance in um, uh, you know, uh, obtaining uh, or uh, finding uh, any of the guidance that we've put out or um, more information about these efforts. And again, uh, we really, uh, and there's a lot more work uh, that, uh, that needs to be done in this area. Um, we've uh, laid out uh, you know, our vision for a strategic approach. Uh, we really would uh, welcome uh, collaborating again uh, with you all um, on this important issue. So thanks. Matt, thanks for that overview of uh, the regulatory activities and outreach and uh, collaboration at, at FDA in this space, and also for those uh, clarifications around these uh, regulatory topics related to bias. Um, next, I'd like to turn to Stephen Konya from ONC. 
Thank you, Matthew, and uh, thank you to my fellow federal colleagues here. It's uh, it's an honor to be sitting alongside of all of you uh, and to be trying to tackle this from a different angle and sometimes complementary angles uh, to, to the way that all of you are as well. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with ONC or the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, real quickly, we're the uh, principal federal entity charged with the coordination of national health IT policy uh, and programs. So we work in concert and in collaboration as a coordinator with uh, all the agencies that are on this panel, as well as significantly many other, uh, many others. Um, we also manage something called the Federal Health IT Coordinating Council, uh, which has over 40 federal agencies and about half of them are under HHS and about the other half uh, like NIST and FTC uh, are not, right? There uh, includes a, a wide range of agencies, including NASA and, and many others. Um, and so we work collectively uh, to try to identify where there's issues or, or opportunities for us to advance health IT adoption uh, and, and utilization. Um, and, and, and for some of them, that's a portion of their portfolio in other areas, it's, it's a larger piece of it. Uh, on the topic of AI and, and today's topic, a deeper dive around bias uh, in, in AI, um, it really intersects with kind of three of our, our current portfolios. Um, you know, Mickey Tripathi, our, our current national coordinator who started uh, on day one of this, this current administration, uh, has established from the onset that health equity by design um, in health IT uh, is something that's very near and dear to his heart. And trying to figure out how can we make sure that the systems that we encourage people to adopt and put into practice, uh, the data that we're encouraged to be interoperable, doesn't lead to or exacerbate uh, further issues uh, in inequities that, that are, uh, you know, exist in our system, uh, in our healthcare system. Uh, and another portfolio area outside of health equity by design is responsible data governance. Um, if you've been following ONC's arc of, of where we started uh, in the early 2000s until today, uh, you know, we started off by focusing on making paper records digital, right? Um, just turning it into a digital format. The second stage was really once it's digital, how does you make how do you make it interoperable so it can be accessible when and where it needs to be um, for the right purposes, um, and that's where we've become to be largely identified with is around our standards work, our interoperability work, um, most recently API work, etc. Um, but the last phase on that strategic roadmap was always putting it to use. Once you have that interoperable data, how can you now realize the full potential of it? Uh, and we think that responsible data governance is an area where um, we, we've dipped our toes in the past and are continuing to look for ways how we can help support that responsible use in the future. And the last portfolio area is our SDOH portfolio. So these these all are interlocked, overlapping Venn, Venn diagram, if you will. And at the center of it, you do see this responsible AI and health IT as it relates to uh, bias and inequities. Um, so like all agencies, we're trying to see what we can do underneath the, the executive orders and the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Act, what our responsibilities and how can we contribute to that. One is as a coordinator, working with our uh, fellow agencies to try to make sure that as we look at all the areas that need to be um, addressed, are there gaps in those areas? Are there roles that we can play as an individual agency? Are there roles that other agencies should be playing and helping kind of monitor and, uh, and, and address the issue? Um, and then also just as, as a coordinator, what can we be doing to help kind of elevate and, and educate? Um, we do a lot of tools, guidance, resource, things like that. And so working with agencies like FTC and NIST, we've put out a number of guidance and things in the past, uh, including AHRQ, we worked with in the past, uh, I think 2016 or 2017, on releasing a JSON report that was co-funded uh, with funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, about the potential realistic implications of AI applications to health and healthcare and to understand those risks. Um, so that's a, a paper I encourage you to go back and look. It's you know five years old or so now, but still very relevant. And I think a lot of those things did come to light. So um, with that, uh, looking forward to being part of this panel and, uh, and again, um, you know, working with our federal agencies and our partners on this. All right, thanks, uh, Stephen, and thanks all of you for providing a lot of information in a short time period. Um, there's clearly a lot going on in terms of regulatory activities and, and further developments. Given that we only have a limited amount of time, I wanted to try to be um, focused on your thoughts about what is coming next that would be most helpful. I know a lot of you can't discuss future regulation, but maybe we could start back with Elam. Um, you made a really important point, I thought, about both the importance of standards for their own sake, a lot of people think about them for interoperability and the like, but also the importance of standards for creating a culture uh, that proactively addresses some of these issues. And I have to say, uh, regulation is much more effective when it 
fits into a broader uh, framework like that, where everyone is, is aware of the issues and we're moving in the same direction. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more, Ellen, about how uh, to promote though, that kind of culture along with the work that you're doing on standards, along with all of the attention that these other uh, agencies are also paying to understanding bias and potentially taking regulatory steps to address it. We're really trying to create uh, a culture, as you said, of, uh, of trust and a culture that gets trust by addressing issues like bias and privacy proactively that builds it in. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, uh, let me start by saying that this is uh, hearing uh, emphasis on a culture of trust is, is uh, really you know, uh, 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 warming our hearts because uh, laboratory that I'm from, the purpose statement of a laboratory is cultivating trust in IT and metrology, and that's really important. And, and in, uh, in that trust, as I said, we're trying to um, give a foundation of what constitutes trust. So there's a lot of technical requirements and social technical requirements to make sure that we build systems that are trustworthy. We completely understand that we can build systems that are trustworthy and have all those you know, technical requirements, yet we have to get, you know, there's a human interactions part and, and building the confidence of the uh, people to, uh, to build trust. So that's also important about standards. Um, and another topic that, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, a veteran of standards and going to standards and uh, editors and uh, uh, writers of standards in biometric area since 2005. And I have to tell you that it's really good day that I see standards is not that boring topic that everybody rolled their eyes on, on it. Standards are extremely important because it gives us a, um, uh, you know, it, it basically uh, uh, specifies the uh, rule of the road and, and gives us all a level play field for uh, understanding a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a having interoperability, interoperability and a uniform lexicon to, uh, to talk about the topics and, <laughs> and, and provide safe space for uh, innovations to, to allow. Um, in, in working towards the standard. So, so again, extremely happy to see that standards and the role of standards is being recognized as, uh, as uh, a, a, a something that uh, provide that uh, 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 rule of the roads and, and a, a plain level field for everybody to uh, uh, compete and safely uh, innovate and, and uh, advance the technology. In developing standards, it's ex it, again uh, uh, for me, and I'm sure for our lab and many of you, it's really important to write standards that are technically sound, clear, implementable. The language is clear and not uh, 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 open to multiple interpretations. Uh, uh, it's technically sound and backed by quantitative data. So if we, for example, go and say, this is bias and that's how it should be. Uh, these, are, these are some methods and methodologies for measuring bias. Uh, those methods and those methodologies are tested uh, and there is a good scientific foundations uh, for that. So uh, how we're doing this, well, we're doing it by uh, uh, bringing the whole community together. Standards is our middle name, but we are not a standard development organizations. Uh, we are not uh, things such as ISO or IEEE that write the standards. Our job is to uh, sit in, in the meetings and sort of uh, galvanize and energize uh, uh, like this. And in my role as the uh, AI standard coordinator for federal government, uh, for federal government to participate in development of the standard. And uh, there are uh, really, really good policies in the in US OMB A119 uh, that uh, specifies standard development in US um, private sector led um, uh, uh, we, the federal government, are uh, uh, helping the U.S. industry in developing standards. And again, I believe that there are many, many good reasons for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So what we can do and what we ought to do and, and we at NIST doing is, again, engaging the whole community, public, private sectors, academia, researchers, uh, to make sure that we have the right uh, scientific foundations for development of standards. Um, talking to you guys, the domain experts, what type of standards are needed, what type of um, uh, uh, you know, to, so we have the, the number of the, the work that we can do is is um, uh, unlimited, right? So we have to prioritize, uh, figure out the right standard development organizations, uh, those that are open, transparent, uh, globally relevant, mm -hmm. uh, care about science, and bring the whole community in advancing that that standard. Uh, 
I know it was a very long answer. I'll stop here. No, it's a, it, it was a it was a tough uh, it's a tough topic. And um, thank you. And Robin, maybe if I could uh, turn to you on the same theme of of regulation that complements other steps to promote culture change. So FTC does have authority, as as Matt said, over a lot of products that aren't regulated by FDA. Um, but FTC's main enforcement comes in the sort of the post-market setting when there are actual uh, enforcement issues to go after, not, not necessarily pre-market. Are there ways in which uh, you think about using that authority that can send the right signals or partnering with other organizations and uh, uh, non-government entities to create a, a culture so that you don't have to do quite so much enforcement? Um, so I have sort of two parts to my answer to that question. And the first part has to do with the way that enforcement uh, can have a, an effect on future action. Um, so, you know, one, I was speaking earlier about our deception authority, my cat, everyone, uh, the other major tool that the FTC has to, um, you know, take action in this space is the unfairness authority, which is focused on consumer harm. And I think it's, uh, could be informative to draw a comparison to the way that the agency has historically approached data security issues, um, you know, which is a very process-based approach um, where we have, uh, you know, or, or the commission has found it to be an unfair practice when companies have failed to kind of take adequate measures to protect consumers' data. And so there are some, I, I think, obvious analogies to the processes that are involved with um, this kind of technology. And the other piece that I wanted to highlight is, you know, in fact, the FTC has issued um, some guidance that I think is, is pretty on point. Back in 2016, the FTC published a report entitled Big Data, a Tool for Inclusion or Exclusion that didn't necessarily use the term artificial intelligence. It used terms like big data analytics, um, but most of the messages are, are really applicable here. And um, the FTC urged businesses, for example, to ensure that they were using data samples that were representative of uh, the relevant population and to identify bias in the data um, and ensure they were not using proxy data in a way that was going to lead to um, you know, disparate impacts. And so I think there is a lot of guidance, as, as Matthew said, that the FTC has issued that is relevant here. Um, and, and the best way, you know, as you said, it, it's, it's hard for us to talk about forthcoming actions because we're not able to talk about ongoing um, law enforcement investigations, but I think always the best way to know what the FTC is going to do in the future is to look at kind of those past actions and also public statements. Um, I also want to flag for everyone in case folks are not aware that the FTC issued or kind of at the staff level, we have issued two blog posts, one in 2020 and one in 2021 that speak directly to um, AI and AI bias and kind of walk through how deception and unfairness authority and some of the other statutes that the FTC enforces um, may relate to that context. So I'm happy to share links to those in the chat of, of this discussion um, so that everyone can take a look at those. Great. Um, let's get those up. And uh, thanks, Robin, to you and your assistant. Um, uh, Matt and Stephen, we have just a little bit of time left. I think with the same spirit of uh, looking forward and thinking about regulation coupled with engagement steps to get to culture change, any uh, quick uh, issues that you'd like to particularly highlight about where you would like to see the community focused and working with you in the months ahead? And Matt, do you yep. want to go first? Uh, Sure. Yeah. Um, just to, to highlight what I mentioned before, the uh, guiding principles for good machine learning practice, this is really a community effort, uh, and we would love to see uh, that community work together and, and harmonize their efforts around uh, these uh, priorities. And just to highlight uh, some of the work that we're doing um, to develop a, a regulatory policy, uh, I think that the um, it was great to hear folks on this call uh, at this workshop earlier today say, that if you don't allow these products to change, uh, that is a risk in and of itself. And so we're developing a framework uh, through a change control plan to allow manufacturers to proactively uh, plan for uh, changes to their product uh, to account, especially for uh, shifts in, uh, in environments of use to make sure that they maintain 
uh, yeah. their level of safety and effectiveness uh, over time. Well, Thank very you. important uh, further issue since this is such an iterative process, a great point and area for engagement. Uh, Stephen, you get the last word. When you're off mute. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I was going to say that's rare that I get the last word. Um, so thank you again for having us on here. Um, you know, just to reiterate that, you know, we work closely with all the agencies that are on here. We're actually going to have a showcase uh, of AI and health IT that's going to be in January on the 14th. So if you go to our website, healthit.gov, um, you can kind of hear a lot more of our comments on this as we kind of tee up that event. Uh, and we're going to have broad federal agency partnership uh, or, or uh, participation in that, as well as a number of uh, other resources. And, you know, much like the many of the ones that you guys are highlighting today, some of those same things we're going to be elevating in, in a slightly different context there. Um, the, the main thing is, is that we know that, uh, you know, FDA is doing amazing work there, really kind of uh, leading the way with, with some of the, uh, the guidance they've been putting out and, and doing it in an open way. NIST and, and FTC uh, and others, we know there are other agencies that have a role to play as well. Um, you know, what role does OCR have? We work closely with them. Our chief privacy officer, who I work closely with on this, um, works closely with them and FTC and NIST as well around a lot of these, these uh, you know, from a privacy and, and security type of perspective. Um, and, and, and we know that that there are certain areas currently right now that there are concerns being raised that, that they are unregulated or unmonitored, especially when you think of the administrative tasks and solutions that are being developed for that and how that might lead to a bias in, in uh, equity issues. So, um, so, so we're still concerned with the fact that, you know, we have a certification program for he certified health IT products and EHR vendors uh, specifically. And, and uh, you know, we feel a little bit of responsibility there. So we're trying to make sure we're doing everything we can uh, to make sure that we're not missing something and, and we're, we're uh, you know, filling those gaps that may exist. Um, uh, thanks, Steve. And I want to thank all of our panelists for this uh, uh, intense and fast moving uh, session that covered a lot of ground. Um, these, uh, I'd also like to thank all of our panelists and participants today for some great discussions. Uh, these are very challenging issues. They are also evolving issues, um, but they are very important issues. So this is not going to be the last word on the topic. Duke Margolis uh, and our team is going to stay very much involved in this. Uh, so, so keep in touch, uh, keep an eye on what we're doing. And for now, I'd like to thank the Pew Charitable Trust as well for providing funding to support this work. And a special thanks to our team at Duke Margolis, uh, Trevin Locke, Valerie Parker, Christina Silcox will be presenting at that meeting in January that you just mentioned, Stephen, uh, Andrea Toomey, uh, Jillian sanders Schmidler, Rebecca Ray, and Brian Cantor for all their efforts in running this workshop and for our continuing engagement on this important set of topics related to bias and promoting health and equity. Equity. And finally, thanks to all of you for your engagement on these issues and for all the hard work that you're doing. Uh, more to come, but for now, uh, thank you again and have a great afternoon and a good holiday season.